601, according to the lineup of participants, we have um, we have a quorum. So let's come to order then at 601. I'm very happy that you're all here. Um, it occurs to me that I may not be alone in feeling a little tired and um, perhaps slightly on edge. Um, while we let, I, I think some of the uh, board members who were in the earlier meeting with Kari, who I see is here, um, maybe let people kind of settle in. Uh, I'll just tell you about a friend of mine who mentioned um, a quality that apparently the, the British poet John Keats held in, in high esteem that Keats called negative capability, which I guess is basically the ability to remain open and receptive um, to uncertainty, confusion, doubt, even chaos as a creative source of new possibility. Um, that somehow seemed to uh, hit the spot with me. And I thought, well, um, it's not only a thing for uh, British poets, but maybe also for school board members um, taking on a budget at, uh, in the middle of a pandemic and um, with everything else that's, that's going on. So um, I'm hoping that uh, having killed a minute or two, I might then um, welcome everyone once again um, and ask if we have any re agenda revisions for tonight. Jonas. Uh, I would just note that the uh, the negotiations update uh, will not be after the IBB training session because that did not happen. We're trying to reschedule that. So just a note about just a note about the agenda. Thanks, Jonas. Um, so we will then skip over three point five. No, let's keep talking about it. We'll just mention what's what's gone on. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, any other agenda revisions before we proceed? If not, um, just a, a, a reminder so that I um, uh, don't forget, uh, when you're not speaking, please mute yourself. And um, mute button is on the bottom left of the, of the window, the Zoom window. Uh, if you're on the phone, star, nine mutes you and star nine then unmutes you. So um, if we have any members of the public who wish to uh, speak, I invite you to do so and ask that if you're able to um, raise your hand, click the raise hand icon, which you can get to by clicking on the participants um, icon at the bottom. Um, and if you're on the phone, star six raises your hand and star six lowers your hand. Um, so do we have any public comments? I see Daniel, please Daniel. Daniel, I, I think you're muted. I was actually just testing you. <clears throat> I um. I, I feel like at this point, I should just be put on the schedule as an agenda note. Um, so if you don't mind doing that, that would be nice. Um, I wanted to thank you all and Brian for today. It was really nice to see the staff gather together today um, and to, to literally spend many hours um, preparing for contingencies. Um, that's, it, it, was, it was good to have that time. Um, I also want to apologize for being the gadfly that I seem to be all the time because um, I have two thoughts to share with you all. Um, one, I'm, I'm asking that you might, again, readdress the idea of a clear threshold um, now that our hopes for not having COVID uh, have, have gone with the wind, um, that we might have like some um, decisive action um, to, to really know when we're going to draw that line. Um, 
two, um, there have been a lot of rumors floating about um, across at least the staff and, and maybe some of some families about a possible remote learning session between the holidays. Um, so in my in my class, speaking of British poets, um, I teach a poem by A. E. Houseman, and it's called "Loveliest of Trees, the Cherry Now." And it's about a twenty-year-old man realizing that he has seventy years to live, give or take, and that means only fifty springs to see the flowers. And he realizes that's not really a lot of chances to see the blossoms. Um, I missed my father's seventieth birthday this year. Um, you know. It, my my last remaining grandparent is probably not going to make it to the next set of holidays, and I have a nephew I've never even met um, because of travel demands and a pursuit of safety and quarantine opportunities as a teacher. Um, so I'm just asking if the board could consider either just quelling the rumor and either speaking to or for whether we will have the opportunity to see our families this year. Um, knowing that I live 500 miles away from my family, um, and I'm sure other other teachers also have uh, the desire to travel to see their families during the holidays. So, you know, if that could be considered and just some kind of clear, decisive choice made again um, as to that opportunity. And that's all I have. Uh, thank you all. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, we we'll look forward to your next appearance. Um, the other members of the public who would like to speak, you're welcome to do so. And if you have any problems raising your hand, then just go ahead and talk. If not, then um, let's proceed to 3.1, student reports, Towns and Emma. Awesome. Um, uh, unfortunately, Anna had a doctor's appointment that uh, she had to go to, but she should be joining in like five minutes um, or like 10 minutes, one of the two, very soon. Um, but I can uh, handle the student report that we made. Um, I guess stuff that has happened so far, the first quarter ended. Uh, and so, you know, people have been submitting in progress quarter grades. Uh, and doing, um, I guess, uh, work with uh, pretty getting those grades in and ending that marking period. Um, there are there's a little bit of like a, a virtual open house happening where teachers can uh, like make videos of what their classes look like so that uh, families can watch them and kind of get a get a feeling of what that's like. Um, we had a, a pretty unique Halloween. I feel for many, <laughs> and I, I uh, many students had a very new time uh, and something that I hadn't really experienced before with this holiday. Um, and there's this big thing, not kind of big, where um, I was able to kind of survey the student landscape, I think, and uh, really talk directly to or get responses from students who were who had questions for the school board or were concerned about different issues and I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I saw uh, in this survey um, as a way of like you know directly communicating student voice to the board. Um, lots of people talked about the the rumor um, about whether or not they, that they'd heard a rumor about potentially closing school between the holidays and they talked about how they wanted that uh, they were curious about that and they didn't actually know if it would be happening um uh there were lots of concerns about um for middle schoolers about whether or not like they would go remote um and what that would look like and whether or not that would be good for them and that um you know, that they would understand that if we had to, but that it would be a hard adjustment. Um, uh, there were questions about, I guess, um, 
uh, not only our response to COVID-19, but how that might change in the future. I think a lot of kids were um, confused about some of uh, what the future of our school looks like and whether or not that will be changing. And there was a sense, I guess, of that students were liked the kind of restrictions that are, are there, not liked them, but um, were adjusting to the restrictions that are currently in place but also um, are aware that like the future is very open-ended and that they would really, that they're concerned about, I guess, uh, a lack of knowledge of what the future will look like. Um, and so I guess these are just, you know, responses directly from the student body that I think the, the school board should probably hear. Thanks very much, Tams. That, that's really interesting. Um, board members, any questions for Tams? Floor. It, how's the college application and all that process going for you guys since you don't get to gather and really talk about that? You're spending the whole year <laughs> to briefly put you in the spot. I have to yeah. In. Um, I can talk a little bit, I guess, about um, it felt a little bit, uh, I think that there were lots of times where a lot of good information was well conveyed after we had SATs, then we got a lot of time to talk directly with guidance counselors, um, about the application process and talk with, uh, English teachers about essays. Um, I think that was really helpful, but I think, you know, it was, uh, there were times that it feels a little bit like you have to do a lot of stuff um, and that like you're kind of figuring everything out um, where like other years, maybe there would be more support, more like group support from your guidance counselor, but because we can't like meet as much, um, there is less of uh I guess there, there, there feels like there's less like um, help that is not being like, not that there's less help available, but that it, it maybe you have to go looking for it a bit more. Um, that being said, I think that um, there have been a lot of really great changes that have been made uh, and kind of um, things that have been organized that have been really helpful um times that had that to talk with guidance counselor that have been really great and i think that a lot of colleges are really open to are like aware of that things are really weird right now and that um that they're a lot very lenient um and understanding so you know i i submitted an application recently um i know other people who are submitting, submitting early decision or early action um applications and I think that they're they're coming together and they're happening um just like you know in a different way than they would other years but they're still happening at the same rate as they would other years thank you good luck yeah amen yeah um other other board member questions for towns um Towns, will Anna have um, something to contribute when she joins us? I can keep my uh, an eye out, or uh, and my colleagues will too, um, if that's the case. We don't want to exclude her. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know we kind of make the student reports together. So every if um everything that normally we are, we've already talked about, like everything that. Uh, we each have to contribute. So I don't, I don't think that there is anything specific, but um, I also, you know, something might have come up that she wanted to talk about, but I, I don't think so. I think it, it should be good. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Towns. No problem. Um, if I, if I might um, take advantage of the opportunity at this point, just to give a shout out to the U32 um, girls and boys cross-country teams 
um, including to proud mom, uh, Jen Miller Arsenault, um, whose, uh, whose son Jacob was uh, number one um, across the finish line in first place in the state's state championships. Um, an impressive feat, uh, just com the boys got just completely locked up the, the top places. Um, Jen, I don't know if you have any sort of comments on that. I would say that our team's results are the, um, are the result of hard work, perseverance, and amazing coaching and commitment across the board. Um, they hear that, you know, they're told, the boys and the girls, that it is a team sport, and absolutely, it's a team sport. It was a joy to behold. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and that's, uh, I think, something that a lot of people may not appreciate, that it seems like an individual sport, but no, it, it's not. It's, a, it's a very definitely a team sport. Um, thank you so much, Towns. Jen, um, should we move on then to superintendent uh, report? Uh, and, and Brian, if uh, I know you're probably already planning to do this, if, if it's a good opportunity to address Daniel's points, um, that would be great. Thanks. Yes, I'll, I'll be more than happy to talk about that in my report. Thank you, uh, Scott. Uh, so I, uh, just wanted to start off that it has been a very eventful uh, last week and a half, two weeks since uh, our last meeting. The uh, We all know what happened over at Doty Elementary School. And I just wanna give uh, uh, publicly, just thank uh, Elizabeth Worth, our COVID-19 coordinator, and the principal over at Doty, Gillian Fuqua, for their leadership uh, and uh, help throughout this entire uh, process, which began on Saturday. Uh, when we were contacted by the Department of Health. And I also want to thank the uh, Vermont Department of Health. Uh, they've been uh, very uh, responsive and uh, have been working with us uh, it, through this uh, it, trial, I would say trial by fire, but trial by COVID in, in many ways. The, uh, so we, just so, so everyone knows, we had decided to uh, go remote for this entire week based on uh, our conversations with the Department of Health. Uh, they, uh, there was a... Uh, as they're investigating and doing contact tracing and, and uh, looking into the matter, uh, again, we, only, we have one case. I, I would I'd say it's only one case, but obviously one case is one case too many, but we were uh, prepared for that eventuality with uh, going to remote. We've been working, our principals, our teachers have been working very hard. Uh, of course, we would have liked to have had this day today that you gave us prior to, uh, prior to this all happening, but uh, I do think that uh, the Doty the Doty crew and the Doty school has done a, a fantastic job in uh, transitioning on a minutes, a moment's notice. The uh, we're going to remain in remote till the end of the week. Uh, we're hopefully hoping to announce that we can go back to in-person learning on Monday. Uh, again, we're waiting to hear more final information from the uh, Department of Health. But the initial conversations were uh, that uh, again, we I made the decision and in consultation with uh, the principal our COVID-19 coordinator and Department of Health folks, that it was better to operate out of an abundance of caution in this regards, uh, to make sure that um, if we could come back on Friday, we could, we might not, the contact, we didn't know when the contact tracing would be over with. We're pretty guaranteed certain that the contact tracing should be over with by Thursday, maybe Friday. At that point, it was like, we're, we're gonna do the whole week. And, uh, and I think the Department of Health was actually very, uh, uh, supportive of that decision as well. Uh, so there'll be more to come, more to follow. We'll be not hopefully uh, I'll be looking forward to notifying families that they can return to in-person instruction on Monday. Uh, as uh, long as uh, we have uh, the information, as long as we get the uh, AOK -okay from the Department of Health. Uh, I don't know if uh, Elizabeth or Doty uh, or Gillian uh, want to add any more here about uh, about what we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just take a, a minute to publicly thank my staff and the community of Worcester for pulling together. Um, certainly was hectic and uh, it would have been nice to get a, a little bit more prepared for it, but I think um, we were served well by our experiences in the spring. 
Uh, and again, just really maintaining that open line of communication with families, I think is the way to go and letting them know what was going on, what we're doing. And um, Jonas can tell you that I flooded his, everybody's email in my, you know, inbox on Sunday with all the information as it was coming in. But again, couldn't be prouder to be serving the Worcester community and working with my team. Thank you for your leadership, Gillian. Elizabeth, is there anything else to add? Is she, oh, there she is. Um, I think that really covers it. It was an in, it was a good experience, and I think we've learned from it. Um, and I just I really appreciated working with everybody over the weekend. It was pretty. We pulled together, and you know, um, just had instant meetings with the Department of Health, who were wonderful in guiding us in what we needed to do next. And um, I just feel like the team, it really works, you know, it, it does. And Gillian has been fabulous, you know, and taking care of everything, all the contingencies. I don't have anything to do with that, with what's going on with Dodie right now, but um, it seems smooth. And, and we've had lots of questions and I feel good about people asking questions because then you can respond to what people's concerns are. I can guess what some of them are, but it's really helpful to get people to email me, you know, it. 10 o'clock at night and say, well, what about this? You know, and uh, so I appreciate this community is wonderful, you know, and I think we're doing the best we can and I think we're doing okay. So. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Gillian, for your leadership. Uh, we had a, uh, it was a challenging weekend to say the least and uh, a challenging week, uh, but I, I can't imagine uh, not, doing, not doing it without you. So thank you very, very much for your leadership. The um, uh, other, we also had a second school that went remote, but not because of any uh, illnesses or vir any viruses. Uh, East Montpelier Elementary School went remote yesterday because it was election day and operating out of an abundance of caution. Again, that's been the motto here, operating out of an abundance, overabundance of caution. Uh, we, uh, we decided to have East Montpelier go remote in order to limit any possibilities of the of the public that's coming into the building during the election, uh, for, just to limit any possibilities of, of exposure, and, and I uh, and I want to say that it was actually uh, uh, very uh, just a little side story with uh, uh, Alicia here. I, I think she contacted me on the second week. I started it back in July, and she said, you know, we, we have to do something about election day. <laughs> so I was like, okay, when is that? <laughs> so, how far along? But she was, she was right, very, very, she was all, all over it. So uh, I'll let Alicia talk more, but uh, her, her and her staff uh, did a great uh, job yesterday. Uh, Alicia? Yeah, um, we had a planned remote day, which means kids brought Chromebooks home and brought breakfast and lunch home on Monday, and we're very well prepared. I'm happy to say that we had 98% attendance. So there were only six students out and that we knew they would be out anyway, just because of illness or other reasons. We learned a number of things, having as I'm sure Dodi has learned this week, probably a lot more than us, what seems to work and doesn't work and what we might need to do different next time. But all in all, it was a really successful day. And I think those packets, uh, that uh, I know the uh, teachers that created really came, really helped out, I think, especially in, in Dodie's case at the beginning when we're in, in the first uh, few days of the school of, of the uh, of the uh, remote days, right? So it, it, I think that's correct, right, Gillian? We had talked about the, the packets. We had we had prepared some, some things, but of course, there's always things you can't prepare for. It. You just try to be prepared. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Alicia and Gillian. But Gillian, uh, you want to talk about the packets at all? Right. Just the, yeah, well, we all of the elementary schools have basically sent home in case of emergency break glass <laughs> packet learning packets for students in the event that we didn't have enough staff or we had to um, close really abruptly. And those, honestly, I have to say, um, were <laughs> one of the first things I thought about on, on Saturday and gave me a huge sense of relief because I thought, oh, we'll just break the glass on Monday <laughs> and use those learning activities. And it gave us the opportunity, it gave us the cushion to rally the staff and get um, 
all of the devices passed out and things connected, you know, set up for the students. So that actually worked really well. So some of the things that we, you know, and like Alicia said, we've learned a ton. It was a very interesting process to go through. Um, the Department of Health, I think Elizabeth and I met with, there were four people. They just ask all kinds of questions. They're so thorough. I felt enormously better after talking to them. So they, they, they get what our struggles are. Thank you, Gillian, and thank you, Alicia, uh, uh, for a, uh, a successful remote day. And I hope that the rest of the week uh, goes well over uh, at Doty. So we will. Uh, so uh, the uh, question I think Scott that uh, Daniel D Daniel had brought brought up was also a question that several board members brought up at the last uh, board meeting, as well. And so I, uh, as you know, I attend a weekly meeting with the Secretary of Education, and uh, when I get really good questions, uh, such as the ones I received uh, last uh, last board meeting, uh, I uh, asked them at the uh, at my meeting. And what, what, what I was told is th that there is there, there is no threshold that a school board at the school boards at the local level should be addressing. Uh, basically, the epi we have to rely on the epidemiologists at the uh, Department of Health uh, to make those decisions of, of when to move along the step one, step two, step three continuum. So right now we're still currently in step three. If you recall, we opened the year up in step two. Uh, the the uh, state has the option of moving the entire state of Vermont or a region in Vermont or a locality, a local school district from step three to step two to step one. They have that, they have that decision-making authority. Uh, where we have the uh, decision making authority uh, is when it, I, we can do we can go remote for certain periods of time. So, for example, uh, and uh, short short periods of time, if there's an operational issue or you have a case. So, for example, the two the two pieces the two schools we talked about today, we can go uh, remote f until the uh, the um, uh, Department of Health advises us that it's okay to. Uh, re reopen and we can we can uh, reopen Doty when that happens. We're hoping that's only a week. Uh, we can toggle on and off for school uh, remote days. If you want, if uh, we, I'm not going to say snow days, but uh, you know, sub day. If you have a sub day or uh, some sort of weather event that would cause folks not to come to school or make it very hard to come to school, uh, we we have that authority to go into a remote day. If you have an election day, for example, and you know that's an opportunity to go remote for that one day. So, so the idea of of, of going into full remote during uh, the holidays, um, and, and I, I have to say, uh, you know, Dan, Daniel has family 500 miles away. I'm sure lots of folks have family members. I know I have family members further far away, um, and I also have uh, the in-laws who live a little closer. You know, but but uh, but it, we're, I'm not going to get into that because my wife's in the other room and she's we've been having that conversation. Uh, <laughs> about how we're gonna see your family over the holiday. And the reality is we have to be very careful about traveling during the holiday. And there, there are some guidelines that the Department of Health is asking folks to consider. Uh, we also, uh, I, during my meetings on Thursdays, which is tomorrow, I will ask the question again. I'm not the only one asking uh, about the, uh, what, what are the state's opinions? What is the state, what is the state thinking about regarding uh, that time period from thir uh, from a, uh, Thanksgiving, in between Thanksgiving and the uh, holiday Christmas, uh, New Year's uh, break. So the uh, the big question that's been coming up it, from lots of folks is, what are we going to do? We have, there's a lot of folks traveling. And so I know that there has been, it's been a hot topic in my meetings. I think it's been a hot topic at the state level. And at the state level, I've been told it's there'll be some additional guidance coming. But we think there's additional guidance coming. And that's been happening for the last few weeks. So I'm really hoping in the next few days we're going to get some additional guidance about that um and, and so so i do think that right now uh we're open for business we're open for school we're um you know we're we're going to be obviously looking to make sure that we're operate we can keep the schools open operationally uh, and we have to be prepared to keep them open but we're also looking to see if there's going to be any additional guidance from the uh state which could come out any day now which may uh further inform our, our uh, thinking here on that matter. 
Carolyn. Do you need or want anything more from the school board around that issue? One of our goals that we all agreed to at the board retreat was, um, now, now I'm not exactly remembering it, but it was definitely around um, having procedures that supported what the staff needed in terms of educating students through this. So do you need anything specific from us? Uh, as, of, as of right now, I'd like to uh, say, let me get back to you on that. Uh, I, I don't want to say yes, or I don't want to say no. Uh, as of right now, we just had our first early release. Uh, we have an early release uh, coming up. Uh, next week is par parents conferences, and then we have uh, another early release. I definitely would like to have some time to think more about that, see what the, what the guidance says, if there is guidance that comes out, and also uh, to get some feedback uh, from my leadership team about how these early release days have been going to prepare, uh, because I know that it was great to get those two uh, early release days for our staff, but I, I do wonder if there's more that we need to do on that regards. Uh, with uh, regards to going remote or shutting down the, the district or anything, I think that's really, we. I really have to wait for uh, guidance from the state and to hear more information from the state, because I think that's really something that is in the, that the uh, agency of education uh, is going to own um, with that. Other board member questions for Brian on this topic? Uh, I may have one, <laughs> uh, Brian. Is there any mechanism for sharing experience, lessons learned um, on going remote uh, for other principals who may, we hope not, well, we know that Kat will at some point, um, but we hope others might not. Uh, is there a way for that experience, uh, Alicia's and Gillian's to be shared? Yeah, uh, I, I can comment, and I'm gonna ask uh, Gillian to jump in here, but the, uh, because uh, Gillian, even though you know, I'm the superintendent, but Gillian lived it, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and is still living it, right? So, uh, but but I think that uh, we do get to share experiences. Uh, I meet with our Winooski Valley Regional Superintendents, and they share their experiences from the uh, superintendent level. And that's and you know, I'm knocking on wood. Uh, we're, we've been one of the last districts in our area that have had uh, such a situation happen. Um, and so I've been able to hear a lot from uh, my colleagues across the state. Uh, the, you know, the Vermont Superintendents Association has also been uh, giving out some pointers and, and information, sharing information about some shared experiences. As for the principals, uh, the uh, we do have leadership team meetings. We have principal meetings which we can share. And I know, and I just actually want to uh, say that Gillian uh, took it uh, took it on herself. I'll let Gillian talk about how she's been sharing her uh, experiences. Um, yeah, I started a document, I think I called it Things Elizabeth and Gillian Have Learned, <laughs> something very eloquent like that, where I just sort of went through what the process was from getting the first call from the Department of Health and, and what happened, and then just sort of tips and things that I picked up, or for example, then today, I, because it's, you know, the, the document's a little bit old, I just sent out an email to the principal saying, oh, by the way, talk to your food service folks about having a, a sort of a cache of school lunch food available should you need to go to remote abruptly and know when your food deliveries are and all that stuff. So working on one, one of the things I really like about this leadership team is we're really good at sharing information with each other and there tend to be a lot of shared Google Docs flying around with the information. So that's that's what we've been doing this week. But, yeah, thank you, thank you again. I would just add to that um, that we're working on an opportunity for our um, full-time remote teachers to meet with our in-person teachers to share some tricks of the trade and things that they've learned, um, just having been remote for the past few months. Thanks very much. Um, any other board member? Questions before we let Brian continue? Uh, then we'll finish the vote count on the same night. Okay. Um, if I might just ask, there might be a, a hot mic somewhere. It's David, see? David Delcor. Uh, 
David, if you can hear me, um, if you wouldn't mind muting, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Thanks. Great. Brian, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, I want to give uh, uh, a big uh, shout out to all the schools. Uh, they did a, and uh, in particular, Amy Molina, uh, she uh, had helped uh, come up with a food drive during in the month of October uh, for our families. And uh, the update that I got, and, uh, and I can have Amy talk a little bit more about it. I think she's here. Uh, she usually is. I see, uh, we have uh, 252 boxes of food were handed out, uh, were collected and ha handed out to uh, families across the district. Uh, and uh, just, uh, just amazing, just amazing how the community comes together during these tough and difficult times. Uh, and, and, and kudos to Amy. Uh, Amy was the one who, uh, you know, approached approach the district with the idea. And uh, she's like, is this possible? And I'm like, well, it's a quick, it's a short turnaround time. And Amy just said to roll up her sleeves and, and do it. So kudos to Amy. So Amy, congratulations for uh, getting it done. And that was a, quite a feat, uh, getting it done in such a short time too. But Amy, do you have anything else to say? Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, it was, it was, um, wasn't exactly a food drive. Um, we participated in the USDA Farmers to Families program. Um, it's similar to the program that operated out of the airports and, and other places um, over our, in our communities this summer. They were close to running out of food, so they didn't have enough to do one of these large scale drives, but they offered schools um, in Vermont and, and other places in New England the opportunity to get these 31 pound boxes of um, of food, and so we put a we put a thing out to our families and asked who needed them, and 252 families said yes, um, which was uh, amazing. Did lead to a little bit of an issue that we did not have the storage capacity for 252 boxes of food, um, which didn't really make sense to me um, for a little bit. But so I, I want to to give a huge shout out to the Cabot Creamery on Gallison Hill. Um, woman named Katie and her staff jumped in to bail us out and um, overnight kept one of the refrigerator trucks running and stored all of the food for us overnight um, and sent out a whole bunch of guys with very strong backs to help us load boxes into trucks um, and get it out. And then that went out to all the elementary schools and to U32 where we had a lot of volunteers from the community, custodians, staff, principals, um, who over the course of two days distributed food um, to our families. So I'm um, really, really happy with how it went and just really thankful for everybody who was able to help us. Um, and Brian, if I, while I have the mic, if I could just do sh two more shout outs. Um, the girls soccer team won their semifinal game this afternoon, um, a big upset and we'll play in the championship game on Saturday. The game um, time is TBA, um, but that's pretty exciting for those, um, for those girls. And then the last thing is I just also wanna say really from the middle school staff, um, I know Dan represented the elementary school teachers today, but the middle school staff wanted me to pass on um, just an amazing amount of gratitude and appreciation for allowing them time for planning and collaboration this afternoon. Um, it was really well received and really needed. Um, and I walked around and watched a lot of people taking a lot of good advantage of that time. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Uh, so uh, those are my major reports. I'm uh, ready to move on into the, uh, the rest of my, my uh, uh, 3.2. Unless anyone has any questions. Yeah, any board member questions before Brian moves on? If not, please continue, Brian. Okay. Uh, the the uh, thank you, Scott. The next uh, piece was the uh, job description, asking for the uh, board to approve the job description for the business administrator. Uh, this was quite a project uh, doing. Uh, we uh, looked we looked at the current the the former job the former job description which was a little outdated. Uh, and we were able to uh, look up uh, many different model job descriptions that exist throughout the state of Vermont and uh, had Lori look, look them over and we went through an entire process. So very time consuming process. 
And I, I don't want you know I don't want to put Lori on the spot here, but uh, I think the original job description that uh, you had was what two or three pages, and now we're up to you know between six and nine pages. The last three pages are, are like the normal HR stuff that are that come with uh, most new job descriptions now, but it is it's expanded uh, as Lori's job since she started expanded. I'll let Lori talk more about that part of uh, <laughs> we went from what two to three pages to six pages. A reminder to me how much um, I have learned and have grown in this district. Um, there's been a lot of changes, you know, at the state level, and it's the last job description was updated in 2003. So I think Brian did a great job getting a comprehensive job description so that you can post the job. And that's my feeling. Um, I didn't really have anything else to add, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, upon uh, getting approval for the uh, job description being approved by the school board tonight, uh, the, we, we did put a preliminary timeline in the packet on uh, uh, posting it, posting the uh, business beginning to the beginning of the uh, business administrator search job search and where we want to post it, uh, you know, where we want to uh, you know, establish salary parameters, beginning a developing a committee to uh, begin uh, pre-screening applicants, uh, interviewing, reference checking, and then selecting a candidate. I think a lot of that will depend on how many applicants we get, we're able to get uh, for this position. Uh, you know, I will say, you know, and I'll say it, Lori, there, lorries do not grow on trees. <laughs> People like Lori are very, very hard to find. Uh, and so, uh, but, but I think by getting, it, getting this description approved as soon as possible, and then uh, posting, we'll be able to uh, hopefully adhere to this sample timeline that we have. Uh, the if you look on your packet, the uh, this might be a dream, but this is the hope. And, and we and if we fall short, then we have to fall short. But the uh, April to June, uh, you know, the ultimate goal is if we do have an opportunity to hire a business administrator uh, to have them cross over with the business administrator uh, with uh, Lori. Uh, you know, hiring them sometime between the April, the months of April and June to have a crossover period where they would be able to work uh, uh, with Lori to get acclimated to our district. Of course, that may be a challenge in itself because most districts are finishing up their year. And uh, if we're hiring someone from another district or another place, they may have to, it may be difficult for them to get away. I'm not sure. Uh, so, so we may have to, uh, you know, think about that crossing, that crossover period, but uh, we won't know until we actually put up the job description, see who's see who's applying, and um, and then move forward with a uh, with this uh, process. Great. So, um, would it be in order, Brian, for us to seek a motion to approve this um, job description for Wonder Woman? Looks like. <laughs> um, would anyone like to move uh, that the board approve the job description for the business manager from page three to eight, I guess? So moved. Thank you, Kari. Uh, second? Second. Floor seconds. Thank you very much. All right, discussion. Brian, would you like to say anything? Yeah, more? I just want to say it's page three Carol. to 12. Sorry. <laughs> three, to, three to 12. Sorry. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Does it include the, the plan, though? I mean, so do we need to amend the motion that it's the job description and the timeline? Because page three is the timeline, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's actually page four. Yeah, you're correct, Diane. It's uh, It would be page four to page 12. Page three is just kind of uh, letting the board know uh, this is where we're thinking about the timeline. But, I, you know, I would I would. I don't think I need the board. Of, I wouldn't be asking the board to approve that just because it's nice to, you know, if, if you approve it today, today, I might try to get it up tomorrow or later on in the week and post earlier than December, you know, so things like that. Great. <clears throat> Thanks for that clarification, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Um, Caroline. I had a question um, on page nine under additional competencies. Um, specifically stress tolerance and self-control. I was wondering if this was um, something that was going to be like is recommended for 
all positions as we're creating yeah. new ones, or if there was something specific about this job that would require that above others? Uh, I, I would say that some of these are boilerplate types of things, Caroline, uh, but I would say that in some ways, uh, this one would be, I think this position, you would definitely need to have a high level of a uh, high stress tolerance. Um, is that right, Lori? <laughs> I think the uh, comment is true uh, because there's a lot of times when you're dealing with the public or you're getting uh, phone calls with complaints and I'm, this is the boilerplate language from another job description from another business administrator. Um, and I just, it probably just puts the point out there that, you know, you work for the public and the board and the superintendent, and there are a lot of night meetings. So you definitely never know what's coming your way. So board meetings sometimes are stressful, so. Um, thank you very much. Um, so a lot less meetings than there used to be. Yeah, this is true. But we managed to concentrate the stress in, in fewer <laughs> instances. Um, so are, are there any other questions, comments, or should we move to a vote? All right. All in favor of approving oh, no. the Oh, no, no, this is sorry. Yeah, just, just one quick question for oh, Brian. Turn, sorry. Uh, Brian, you mentioned wanting to hire someone sort of in the post-April time period uh, so that there's some overlap with Lori. If for some reason you find a candidate before then um, and, you know, and there's a window of time where you need to hire someone before April, um, you know, I, I think we'd love to hear about it. And if, you know, it, you know, obviously we want, you know, to spend as little money as possible and not have too much overlap. Um, but let us know if you get into a situation like that. I definitely will. Thank you, Jonas, for that uh, latitude. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would support that as well. All right. Um, ready for a vote then? All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I'm seeing all yeses. So the motion carries. The job description is approved and we can continue, Brian. Okay, uh, so, and then thank you all for that. Uh, the uh, next one is uh, just a little update uh, from our uh, technology consultant. He's been uh, working on uh, some, uh, some uh, several different, several projects uh, and I can just have him talk. I, we, the first thing I, I put him in here for was about the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot and internet access uh, in the access, ex acceptable use agreement. I recall back in July, a uh, board member had asked me if, with regards to how are we trying to help our families who do not have access, internet access to our, uh, to, to, to just accessing technology at home uh, based on, uh, you know, we live in Vermont. There's many different uh, areas of, of our state, unfortunately, that do not have good broadband access. Uh, so I know uh, our technology consultant has been working on that. And uh, I'll let him talk about it just briefly. Jim? Thank you, Brian. Uh, the, the, the policy that you have in front of you is just about um, the exchange of uh, hotspots with, uh, with uh, families of uh, students um, as these devices go home. Uh, we have a bigger effort, which we'll talk about in a future meeting, which has been led by uh, Lisa around um, procuring a new engagement with a um, – with, uh, with T-Mobile, so we'll get into that separately. She's done an outstanding job spearheading that for us. But what you see in front of you is the policy and the process by which um, you know, we'll lend out equipment. We'll check it in every three months, if not sooner. Um, and it's, uh, it's meant for our families in need that have limited um, um, you know, broadband access in their homes, but do have cellular coverage in their homes and, or around their homes. And so um, that's the policy you have in front of you. And in some ways it mirrors a, a similar policy you have as far as um, you know, lending out devices like Chromebooks and things like that um, to students as they um, as they uh, uh, learn remotely. So, Brian, back over to you. And, and I would just say that, uh, you know, we didn't have this. Now we have it. And I would just also reiterate uh, that it's not a policy. OK, because that's your that's your role. <laughs> uh, this is just more of a uh, uh, an agreement that we have uh, an acceptable use agreement 
uh, for using unfiltered internet access for families that were supplying the hotspot for so they can access uh, the internet uh, in their home in order to uh, access schooling at a uh, in access our schools in case we go in case we go remote or or uh, if in case they just need it just to be able to access schooling so do you, do you need any board approval or any action on this Brian or um... I, I mean I don't think so I mean I just you know I wanted you to be aware that we have a, an acceptable use contract for unfiltered internet access which we didn't have before I don't know if you I mean it's it's you could if you wanted to, uh, but I, I don't think it's necessary. No, I don't. I don't believe it's necessary either. If um, anybody disagrees and and feels the need for the board to vote on it, otherwise, if board members have questions or um, anything to say about this, about the the hotspot initiative, just thank you. Yeah. Just and uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, Lisa LaPlante over at U32. Uh, they've been working together on uh, on trying to expand this uh, opportunity for many, many families. Uh, and then, uh, last but not least, uh, Jim, I just give you I'll give you a, I'll give you the floor for a couple of minutes just to update the school board on some of the projects that you're working on, so uh, folks uh, are aware of what yeah, you're doing. Thank, thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. There's been many things that we've looked at over the past. You know, three and a half weeks I've been I've been working um, here at the school district and I appreciate the opportunity um, you know first and foremost we've been working on the uh, the IT assessment and specifically the application matrix storage and virtualization infrastructure needs to see where our gaps are and where we have to um, you know where we have to remediate those gaps and so um, that's something that's been very important to us um, you know um, I had uh, today spent time with uh, various storage vendors uh, we do have a, um, you know, our storage is coming up on renewal from a support perspective this year, which is pretty important. Actually, it was something I just learned about um, when I was doing uh, some analysis with Doc, and it looks like, you know, we're going to have uh, the need to either, um, you know, um, renew our, our storage storage uh, support agreement uh, at the end of the year or look to uh, to procure some new storage. We're already having some storage capacity issues as, as we speak, and so uh, we're looking to try to see if we can uh, – you know, getting RFI done and those types of things, you know, uh, by the end of the year. Um, I did talk with um, a couple of companies today, Hitachi, Pure Storage, and um, EMC, uh, Dell EMC, on their storage platforms, told them that an RFI is coming, gave them the parameters, and we're moving through that process. In addition, we've been meeting with the IT members, uh, working through, you know, several different purchasing items as it relates to the different schools, application needs that they have, and we're finally starting to get through that list. It's been out there a few weeks as we've gotten on board and tried to figure out you know, what makes sense and what should wait and what do we already have versus what we don't. I think we're making some progress there. Um, you know, um, you know, finance as well as uh, IT and, and, and Sarah have been a big help there. And so I very much, I very much appreciate uh, Lori's help as well as uh, Sarah's help in getting that done. Uh, we did have some big major issues with some outages uh, related to um, uh, what we call distributed file services. That's like how you, how you do uh, one way in which you do file storage uh, in the, in the environment. So I worked with uh, the team and, you know, clean that up and, and rebuilt some of that that work and then took out some things with them. And, and so we have a, a stable environment now. Um, we have another big issue in the environment for non-Google uh, Chromebook machines. We did have a Windows update service that wasn't updating machines properly. It was failing for several months. And so um, we've begun cleaning that up. We have, you know, several updates that are running properly. Uh, we still have more work to do in that environment. We'll rebuild that here in the next couple of weeks. We also have deployment services we're testing and we'll roll out here in November. Um, we did talk about the hotspots. Uh, we do have um, a draft process that will be coming to um, to the board uh, for approval. Well, maybe not for approval now, based on what we talked about, but um, it will be about um, you know how do we identify um, applications that are needed in the classroom? How do we vet them? You know, how do we go through the purchasing process? How do we get that approved? And making sure that we don't run into equity issues over time with students. And when we offer an application out, you know, to to solve a need, we're going to be looking at that across the district as opposed to on a on a school by school basis. And so there's still some work to do, but I'll have a draft plan for Brian next week that will uh, will circulate in a future meeting to the board. Yeah. Can I just interrupt you there, uh, Jim? That last part, I, I just wanted to make sure the board is aware. I think this is a, a very uh, important piece of the work that Jim is doing. I mean, they're all important, but and the storage issues, virtualization, but uh, the piece about you know trying to streamline our processes of how we purchase apps. In our technology, in our classrooms across the district, and how they use how we use them, and how do they align to our curriculum and uh, 
I think is going to be an important process. So just wanted to, sorry, Jim. Just no, thank ahead. you, Brian. I'm going to be quick here because I got three more things, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to get them done in the next 30 seconds here. Um, Casey and I have been working with the electric company on um, uh, the EV, uh, the electronic vehicle ports, um, you know, out over at Rumney. Um, to, um, they're coming up on, um, they're coming up due here in the next year. And, uh, we got to decide if we're going to, you know, continue that process, all the recommendation along with Casey to the board here in a future meeting, uh, we're working on Cisco umbrella services, which is really a security thing, uh, about, uh, you know, how to manage our, our, um, our devices, uh, as well as a thing called AMP, which is antivirus malware protection, which we're getting ready to put in place. Um, and, um, you know, again, we've been, you know, um, looking at, um, you know, demoing some block and object based storage. That goes back to my first point earlier. And most importantly, we're looking at a security um, a piece called air gap technologies, which is uh, trying to figure out ways to uh, to secure, you know, it's, it's like a defense in depth strategy to make sure that you can eliminate or at least minimize the risk of, of security attacks and ransomware and things like that. So. There's a tremendous amount we're working on. Um, I will tell you that um, my work is in, in no way possible without you know the help of so many people. You know Brian's team. You know we've had uh, you know Michelle and Jen and the team, uh, Lori and others, who have been I incredibly instrumental so far. Uh, the IT team has been great as well, and uh, you know we've been very fortunate to have such a collaborative team so far. And 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 you know I've been primarily working with you know Doc and Sarah for the most part, but there'll be others that will will continue to loop in as we make some some improved changes here, but um, it's been, it's been a good team and I appreciate the opportunity. Brian, Brian back over to you. Thank you, Jim. I don't know if uh, I'll turn it back to Scott. Uh, just any sure. questions? Yeah, that that's, that's terrific, Tim. Many thanks. Um, Thank board member questions on any of this? If not, um, Brian, is there anything else under superintendent? Uh, no, I think that's all. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Then we can move on to finance committee and turn it over to you, Flora. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so we'll do a quick update and we'll, we'll start just with, we had the opportunity to meet with Bill at our, at our um, finance committee meeting this yeah, just yesterday. So we don't have a written anything, but I took some notes and I'll try to be as efficient as possible. So uh, Bill Ford, as you know, has been our clerk of the works and has been overseeing about nine projects uh, right now. And they're almost all fully uh, finished. Um, I'm not gonna elaborate in all of them. We do have two projects that might be going past the 2021 uh, deadline. So they won't be done uh, this December uh, 30th. Those two projects are, in, the Ber in Berlin, we're going to need to do some paving work, and we're also going to need have a three-year, well, two-year to three-year um, window to do some, um, it, to do two ponds. Is it one pond? No, it's two ponds at U32 and one pond at, it, uh, at Berlin. Yeah, for, the retention ponds. <laughs> the retention ponds, yeah. So it's two water projects, and we, uh, we're waiting for one permit still in, in Berlin. But uh, at U32, we, we have what we need, but we have a two-year and a three-year uh, window to do those projects. In Calas, most importantly, uh, we are in a fast track with that project. Uh, we do not have, uh, a, we don't know exactly what the funding is going to be there. We're still waiting. Uh, Lori, as always, has moved many is, you know, put many hats in the air, and we're hoping that one of those is going to get hold, and we're going to um, be able to to do it, but uh, they've been coordinating in order to, to get this project done. That project needs to be done by uh, December 30th in order to go into the CARES Act. Um, any questions about, do you have any, I know I'm going really fast, but I'm just trying to update on the on the projects. And then uh, we talked uh, briefly uh, for a long time really about um, the ability to continue to work with uh, with Bill Ford. So Bill is our clerk of the works, which is not the facility person that we're looking for. A clerk of the works is required uh, anytime we have a construction project. Uh, we He's, excellent and we want to be able to retain him so as a committee we we uh, we were going to propose to you we our recommendation is that we continue this uh, this contract with with bill he still has a few hours left on on this year and uh, we'll continue to manage the projects that we have right now we want to have a you know 
we, we have going to have a proposal for him for next year because we know we would need to do more facility work. We don't know yet what that facility work is going to be for next year. Our initial plan is to have a, a first meeting with the list that some of you have seen and some of you haven't seen yet. It, but the facility committee, facility committee, the finance committee, I'm so used to being in the facility committee, uh, the finance committee is going to take a first look at that. Uh, Brian, Bill, and myself are going to meet to do a first just general uh, overview of the work that needs to happen. And then we will meet as a finance committee and then bring that back to you so we don't spend a lot of time going through, through that list. Uh, and let me just continue to go down my notes here. And Brian and Please jump in if I forgot something about um, about Bill. And basically, we we feel comfortable with the amount of hours. It might be a little less hours that we be that we'll be using next year, but we would want to give uh, some. Uh, you know, we're, we will give Brian the ability to figure that out with uh, with uh, with Bill. So I'll stop there for that first part. Uh, to see if there's questions about Bill Ford's uh, work or facilities update. No, okay. And, um, and, and uh, the one thing that I forgot to mention in the capital project is that we do have as a target having a capital uh, plan for, for, all the, for, for all the buildings. And we really feel strongly that we have to, we would like to move forward in a future in our future budget to have a facilities director. And then, it, yes, Brian. Yeah, and, and I'll just uh, talk just one more thing because uh, I think it's important just for folks to know. Uh, the, uh, the bill is an hourly, he works on an hourly basis. Uh, so if he does it and we up to a certain amount of hours that we already have in, the, in our budget. So it's if we don't use those hours, we don't pay him those hours. He's under an hourly, an hourly wage. So uh, it really isn't, um, yeah, it's not like a set amount of money, but we put the money aside. And, and I have to say, uh, I want to commend the board for last year because you know, we put you put extra hours into the contract. And this this past summer, I mean, we we we've used him on all. The, we we would not have been able to open the school uh, without him. Uh, the schools, I mean, between the air vent working with the contractors and air ventilation and all the nine projects that you had pre-approved him last year, on top of all the COVID stuff that we had to use him for our facilities getting the isolation rooms up and running. Just so many things that he had done. And now this callous ventilation project, uh, it's, I, I think it's just been a very good investment uh, for the district. Yeah, and, and last year we had put about uh, 1,248 hours when we first met with him, with Duran and myself, and he still has about 349 hours left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, we would probably use them, we're not sure, but Th that is right. We don't. It's uh, it, basically what we're doing is trying to hold him so that every time we have a project, we don't have to go out to bid for a clerk of the works. So, yeah. so that's what we're asking for the board. So, Scott, I don't know if we want to stop there to make sure that other that the board as a whole feels okay with that recommendation, and then move into the budget. Sure. Thank you, Flora. Um, how do you feel, board members? Are you are you okay with what Flora is talking about with our proceeding with the um, with the contract with Bill Ford as clerk of the works? That I, I might just add that the um, the membership of the finance committee was hundred percent in favor. Uh, Chris <clears throat> Chris just wants to know more as he always does, and I, I'm sorry that he's not here tonight. Um, he has a client, but. Um, <clears throat> Floor, um, looks so, to me as though everybody's okay with it. Okay, so and I don't think we need board action. So Brian, you feel that you have what you need? Yep, to ready to that? move forward, absolutely. Okay, so then 3.2 is budget draft one. And I'm not, I think for, I could go through the highlights, but I think to be fair to the board, I would like a, Brian to present what this budget signifies for our district and then move on with Lori. Is that okay, Lori? Great. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Floor. So the uh, a, a school budget uh, is not, is, 
when folks think about a school budget, uh, a lot of times it's, you tend to just look at the paper and the numbers that come out on the page and what does this mean? What does it look like? How is this gonna impact uh, the money that we have, the money we don't have, the money we wanna have? Uh, but it really represents a lot more uh, than that. It really represents the hopes and dreams of our, of our entire school district community. And uh, I know our board and uh, myself and our educators, we know that our, our responsibility is to prepare our students for uh, the uh, future. And it's also to, our responsibility is also to support student achievement. So uh, any budget that is put forth and uh, put forth to uh, the voters uh, later on uh, in the school year, uh, must represent opportunities and defines what our school board values. Uh, as a recently merged school district, I believe our budget uh, exemplifies our values. And uh, so, and, and in many ways, I, and I hear that a lot from board members, making sure as superintendent that I uh, always try to make sure my actions mirror the values of the community. I've heard that many times. And I, I know that, uh, you know, a board, you know, should not just be solely looking at cutting costs because a budget is really about kids' lives and our collective future as a society. And so uh, I will say that uh, this is a level budget that uh, I know the board had asked Lori to put forth. And you know, there, if, if, if anyone asks me the question that it, will this budget improve student outcomes, uh, I would say that, uh, the budget, the current budget that we currently have presented will not likely uh, continue the current uh, outcomes because this is a level service budget. So we're trying to improve current outcomes. We have level service. So we're kind of uh, in making the investments in our uh, school, but it's really just keeping things the same way they've been. Uh, so currently I know that our student outcomes are, uh, while they're high, uh, it, they're, they've also been flat for a number of years. And uh, they're something that we definitely do have to consider about how to improve our student achievement. And so while many folks are happy with the current status, because we are a great district, right? We, 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 do, we do a lot of great things here. Uh, how, I think that are, there are some folks who think that uh, we can also continue to, to do better. And uh, so as a result, this is why uh, I'd ask the board to conduct a, a curriculum management review to identify some things that we need to, uh, we, we're doing well, some things that we could do better and improve upon. Uh, and it may cost uh, some additional funds or maybe it won't cost, uh, it, or may, maybe uh, at the very least, it may require a reappropriation of resources uh, that we have to do for our, uh, to meet the needs uh, identified in our district. So I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, this is a, a first draft, it's a level service. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, our communities, our school board, the leadership team, teachers, staff, uh, the curriculum management review, speaking with students, I think that there's lots of opportunities to get a lot of stakeholders involved uh, as we go throughout this process and we start looking into the, uh, into possibly having a strategic planning towards the end of the year where we start developing a strategic plan based on what we learn from all these things. Uh, but I do want to say, again, it's a level service budget. Uh, it will... Uh, it does and, and will do, uh, do what it's been doing uh, for our students. Uh, but I do think that the board should be aware that because it's level service, uh, it, we're not actually making major uh, improvements into what we're currently doing. Sorry, Floyd, that was a mouthful. Thank, but <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, Lori, do you wanna move on into the highlights? the budget process yeah yeah I'll, yeah I'll just talk about the budget process uh, so we began the process in early October uh, I met with each principal uh, we discussed the timeline we discussed the level service budget uh, we uh, and then over the past few weeks Lori prepared a uh, Lori and I also went around and met with each principal uh, and we and Lori prepared a level service draft a budget and we met with each principal to review their uh, respective schools uh, and so uh, last year, there was a, a list compiled of future budget considerations. We reviewed that list and identified what items could be considered or should be considered for the fiscal year 21-22. Uh, one piece of, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, right off the bat is the uh, U32 
uh, noted that there were some unbudgeted uh, maintenance items that were previously in included in their school's capital budget. Uh, so last year, I believe this information was compiled after the budget process concluded, and it was in the amount of $179,000. Uh, for budget fiscal year 21-22, the total is $363,000. So, uh, you know, we still need this, because this list was put together so quickly, uh, we do need to, uh, we need some more time to verify and analyze uh, some of these items. Uh, some of these items that are on this, uh, this uh, list for $363,000, uh, does include some one-time items, which we may be able to purchase this year, uh, just to put that out there. And uh, this budget adjustment is included on the bot on the budget summary of changes uh, of the changes page in a separate box at the bottom. And I don't know if Lori, you want to say anything else about that, or you'll save that for your uh, report. Yeah, I'll just cover it when we get to that line, if that's okay. Okay. Um, do you okay. want to do the student information or do you want me to do it, Brian? Yeah, I can talk about the student information. Um, I, I, and I think uh, I, I, I want all the board, uh, put, I really think that this is uh, something that um, I don't want to say it keeps me up at night. My daughter keeps me up at night, Zadie, little Zadie, who ran in here before. So I, uh, but uh, one of the, I guess when I, when I started here in July, the thing that was uh, the forefront of my mind was the reopening of schools. And now as we get into the budget, uh, the, bu the budget and getting into, uh, and I learn more and more about our amazing district, there is something else that's I think very serious that uh, is, is going to impact our, their future of our budget. And that's, uh, and you know, I don't, it's, there's never a good time to talk about it, but I, I think it's my fiduciary responsibility to bring it up to the board. Uh, there are, uh, two census reports. It's really about the student census information that's happening. It's happening across the entire state of Vermont, by the way. So it's not just a Washington Central uh, matter here, but our census is going down uh, significantly each year. So uh, I will just say that uh, in October 1st, 2019, the census was 1,574 students. October 1st, 2020, the census was 1,400. 87 students. Uh, the total decline in enrollment was 80 is 87 students. Now there was a decrease of uh, 93 students in the elementary schools. Uh, and I'll explain the numbers to you, but I can and then also explain some of the ways we've been thinking about these numbers. Uh, but we have 37 less students in pre-K and 56 less students in grades one through six. Now we know that it's COVID. It's a co it's been lots of folks have may, may not have decided to send their kids to school this year homeschool kept up, but either way, uh, our, our census is down. Uh, and that really impacts our bottom line of how much money we end up getting from the state for because of our the census and the uh, ABM of how many students we have coincide with exactly how much money the state ends up giving us to uh, educate our children. Uh, there was also a um, an increase of six students. Unfortunately, though, there's one thing I, I also want to say in addition to the decrease at the in the uh, elementary grades, there's also been a uh, a decrease um, in, at students in U uh, thirty two. Uh, there was an increase, by the way, this year of six students at U thirty two. However, uh, in meeting with U uh, thirty two leadership uh, and talking about, it, there does continue to be a decline in tuition students at U thirty two. So. The budget draft that you have that was given to you uh, is projecting nine less students, and that's an estimated loss of revenue in the amount of one hundred and eighty-six thousand uh, dollars. Brian, uh, sorry, sorry to sorry to interrupt. I noticed that Jill just put up her hand. She may have something related to this. Jill, is this something that you'd like to address now? Uh, yeah, I, Brian, you can answer this whenever it makes sense, but. I was just trying to understand if you're, you think we're seeing a trend. I mean, I, we're certainly seeing a, a change from one year to the next, but I, I wasn't clear if you thought it was a trend. Well, so, so and uh, and that is the big question, right? So if you just let me think, yeah. uh, let me just go a little bit longer. I think sure. we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, so uh, we did budget for 53 students this year. We have 49 students. Uh, we are projecting 45 next year. So we are anticipating, so we do, whether or not it's a major long-term trend, uh, 
it does appear that the, it may be a trend uh, with the numbers going down, especially at the high school. Um, the uh, again, we don't know about the uh, elementary school, uh, uh, and so what do we are doing some additional homework. I've asked the elementary principals uh, to collect birth information from their town clerk's office, contact families who are three years or older, who are not currently enrolled in our preschools. To say, hey, how you doing? You coming to school next? What's going? How you doing? I'm the I'm the principal at, you know, X school, and uh, you know, they're going to contact these homeschool students also to see if they'll be returning next year. So I think we have some homework to do in that regards. Uh, the the research piece, uh, we're also asking U32 to look into researching the tuition student information and the homeschool families to determine next year's projected enrollment. Maybe there's some other information that we can collect to find out. So I think in the next few weeks, I'll be better prepared to start answering that question about uh, next year's enrollment projections. And if this is a trend that is continuing, or is this a blip in a, a two or three year radar that is this is a blip in the, in the last this current two or three year pattern, which will work itself out maybe because of COVID. And that's what we're trying to, to get our heads around right now. But uh, it's, I think it, I, it would be irresponsible of me as superintendent not to bring this up to the board because this is something that uh, we, we just need to keep our eyes on. Uh, and uh, we do have some uh, enrollment projections that have been done by uh, some other uh, other folks. And so when I get this information, I'll be prepared to share more information with the board in a future meeting. All right. That was my turn. Thank you, Brian. Um, and so I wanted you to know that we did provide you with the current staffing that's in this budget draft, and it is on page 19. And it's the same format as last year. It's quite um, quite dense. Woo! And, and it has all the information by school of the number of teachers and their specialties and their programs um, by building. What's not on this report is the um, Washington Central staff there are some of them listed on the report for special education, but there's still others who are throughout the district, like speech teachers, um, occupational therapists, job coaches, et cetera. So all totaled, um, this budget draft includes 337 FTEs. Um, and I guess I'm just gonna move right into the budget change page, which is on page, let's see, 20. Um, so at the top of page 20, you will see, um, the estimates we have included in this budget for negotiations. We've put in a salary estimate, some benefits related to salary increases. Um, we've put in a health insurance estimate at 10%. We've just learned um, that they're asking for a 9.6% rate increase. So if nothing else changes, that would be a savings of about $13,000. Um, so the total negotiated items in this budget are a little over a million dollars or 2.85%. Um, the early retirement program um, resulted in a savings. Uh, the next line is a savings of 223,000 and that reflects um, savings from this year for people who cost less through health plans and their salaries that would continue into next year as well as a savings for the early retirement program. Um, all totaled over a four year period, the early retirement program is slated to save $275,000. Um, that is a savings of about 2.4 unfilled positions. Um, and there were 15 people that took the early retirement. Um, moving down to the next item, a level service budget includes positions that are currently funded by COVID or anticipated to be funded by COVID. Um, we have two full-time positions here. Um, those are in this draft budget, but they are a budget increase um, because the school district, if those positions continue, would need to fund those locally. So you'll see the 205,875 line. Um, our special ed staff has continued to grow. Um, we've transferred uh, staff from being contracted services to employees. We also have a number of paraeducators coming into kindergarten that previously were funded in preschool programs. So we have increased about seven full-time positions in paraeducator positions, which is a total of 272,000. Um, the special ed budget will continue to be updated. So this is just the draft one level service. Usually by draft two, we have a, a firmer handle on the student information 
Uh, the December one is the count date for special education students. So by your December meeting, we should have a firmer budget that would re reflect our current state. Um, so if you add those items together, that's a 3.57% budget increase for staffing. Um, going down to non staffing items such as technology and food program, there really wasn't enough time to put together a level service budget. So we basically level budgeted those two areas at this time. Um, we will have a lot more information once the COVID CARES Act is finished in the next couple weeks, as well as working with Jim on the tech plan and confirming that we have sufficient funds and a level service budget, or do we need to increase or change? So we left those with level um, budget. Um, the tech education tuition is the money that we would spend um, for students who would go to Spalding and some other technology tech programs. We've put in a 6% increase as an estimate. Um, we'll know more in December um, because they usually try to set their prices early December. Um, the transportation service increase is related to our current contract. Next year would be the last year of our five-year contract that we have. And so that's a budget increase of about 45,000. And you heard me speak about the increase in paraeducators and special ed, but there'd be reductions in pre-K that would help offset that. Um, so the savings is 112,000. Um, we also have uh, savings in special ed programs for tuition and contracted services. Some of it's related to us hiring our own staff instead of outsourcing, as well as the fact that we've had um, one group home that's currently discontinued in Berlin. So we've um, had a huge reduction in the cost for our state place students. So all totaled our base budget increase um, for non payroll items and payroll amounts to a 2.42% increase. Um, there's a slight change below that line for the debt service. Um, it, I was reminded to tell you that next year would be the last year that U32 would have a bond payment um, for the facility. So that's a, a savings next year, but not this budget cycle, but the one after of about 159,000. Uh, but for this year, it's just the standard uh, decline in the bond payments of $18,000. So for the expense budget, it's an increase of 237. Um, and then Brian mentioned some of the revenue information that we've learned um, that we are projecting, and it's pretty much nine less students from the town of Orange. Um, all our other towns have been stable compared to our projections, but Orange. So I know Lisa's going to reach out and try to figure out how can we recruit the orange students or if this is going to continue for a while? And I think it may be one other town. I don't want to just say it's just orange. No, I, think I, it's a, I analyzed yeah. it. It's only orange. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> right. Um, and the small schools grant, we actually um, currently have an increase this year and it's projected to be an increase next year of 29,000. Um, and then the special ed reimbursements would go up with the spending increases of 102,000 revenue. And um, for those who've been on the board for a while, you heard me say that last year, um, we reduced our transportation costs for to and from school and that we could expect a potential revenue decline. That would be in this next, next budget cycle of 54,000. So the revenues are down, which results actually in a tax increase. So the tax increase uh, for the level service budget is 2.67%. Um, and then the box below is what Brian referenced with regard to the U32 operation of plant repair and maintenance budget previously um, in the capital budget. We did not cut the capital budget to help offset this. I know um, Stephen's still collecting information and we can go through this line by line for the next budget process, but we felt it was our due diligence to share this with the board so you would at least know um, that it did miss last budget cycle. And if that was approved by the board, it would be 3.7% net impact on taxes. The next page is the format for the town report. And what it shows is that we have an actual column. Last year we didn't, um, but the thing to consider about the actual column is it was a prorated year because we closed early due to COVID. So there's probably a lot of lines there that are savings. Um, for the next draft, um, I'm going line by line for a three year history to double check um, how to modify the budget. We're hoping to find savings that would help uh, for the potential need for um, protective equipment and for sanitation uh, costs that we expect will continue to next year. 
and will not be in a reimbursement mechanism. Currently, those will be reimbursed under COVID for the bulk of the year. Um, so you'll see a lot more detail um, in the next draft. Um, and in the next draft, um, we put in the packet a list of those areas that we were going to look at. It's on page. So, Laurie, not to, not to interrupt you, but I know this has been an important question for the board before. Uh, when you were explaining uh, the 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 last draft that you you just mentioned that you're coordinating with the town clerks to make sure that we include the information that that works best for for each town right so um there. last year we did not include any pages in the town reports we did our own report um and i've been trying to collect from the town the information from last year's reports if they did print something um the town clerks are really busy so they haven't all gotten back to me but i've asked each one of them to send me a copy of last year's town report so we could better learn did they include anything about the schools or not um, we were expecting to have a town report format and report conversation with the draft two budget in december um, thank you and then we have a list on page five of those other items that we would consider uh, for the next budget but i know brian has some uh, new initiatives he wanted to talk about next I, again, could we could we pause for a minute and see if people have questions and then move into the new initiatives? Is that okay? Scott, do you want to manage that? Do you want me to call? I see Caroline has a question. How do you want Go to ahead and should I send it back to you? You manage it, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. Ca Caroline? Thanks. Um, I had two questions. So I wanted to make sure my math was right. The difference between the savings in pre-K and the extra in kindergarten, did it round out to be around 112,000? Sounded like it was 200,000 more for seven pairs in kindergarten, but then a savings in preschool? No, that's seven pairs throughout the system. Some the of whole them system, are not just in K to six. Correct. Um, that, the savings. Okay. Yeah, it's not necessarily related. And if you um, think about it, kindergarten is a full day and preschool is a part day. Yes. So the cost would be the difference of um, yes. currently a pair is like a 0.29 or a 0.4, depending on the school in pre-K and they would be full time in kindergarten. So there's a differential of 0.6 to 0.7. Yep. I had one other question. Um, the comment about losing the state play students in Berlin. I had been under the impression, but am thinking maybe it was inaccurate, that any costs associated with state place children is 100% reimbursable. Is that inaccurate? True, and I did factor in the revenue shortfall as well as the savings in this draft. So, so it is dollar for dollar, you're absolutely correct. So we technically don't, save anything from losing state place students. True. And, okay. and if you lose the equalized pupils, which is part of the formula, then you've lost some of the state aid that that's what Brian's trying to help collect right now for information. And it, and I want to stress that point, not for Lori, who I think has given us like real detail, but for board members to recognize, because I don't want there to be a goal that we don't have state place children in our district or anything like that. And to understand that um, there is no cost associated when you have state placed children. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Dorothy, I see your hand up on the... Um, on, on page 20, where we come out with the impact on taxes at 2.67 for one number and the other is 3.7 that I guess includes uh, maintenance and operation of the plans and so forth. Are those percentages based on, on what number of students? On the last year's students, this year's students? If there's a lot fewer students, won't that increase our taxes substantially if we have to come up with the same amount of money, but we have fewer students. It seems to me that that percentage would go up in a pretty drastic way 
Um, and I'm correct. I'm, um, these percentages are using it compared to the last to the current budget year. So those percentages use the $35 million budget that we're currently having for the explanation. You were right. If all of the students were level, then that would end up working out for the tax formula the same. But in a year of a declining population, then then it will exponentially increase the tax percentage. So we will know more around December 15th is when the state is supposed to provide us with student counts. They have said at the legislature that they're going to um, level our statewide. Everyone's seeing a reduction. So they were going to level the current year's students, whether you've had a decline or not. Um, but that formula has not been shared with us to verify yet. So we will have a lot more revenue information in the next budget draft. But because that, that really concerns me because if our tax increases are too high, we may face um, voting down a budget in these times where people are having a hard time coming up with the money just to feed themselves. So I'm really concerned about that aspect. And I really understand Brian's that we are, we are a, a excellent uh, school district in many ways and that we have a good reputation and yes, we want our budget to reflect an increase in opportunity, but there are times when families have to even flatline for a while in order to recuperate from some kind of a financial disaster, which this is and has been for much of the state. So I just, I, I really want to be very careful of that bottom line this year, as much as I'd like to put extra money here and there. Um, I, I think we have to really make sure that, that we don't overdo saying how wonderful we are and we have to give more money in order to stay wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And I just want to say that we did, uh, uh, Lori, I have a question back to you just on that. Uh, I thought you had, we had talked about December 1st was when you would have more information. You said December 15th uh, to see if they will hold us harmless about the students. December 1st is when they announce the official tax rate okay. and the um, expectations for some parts of the formula. The child count information just barely went in. Um, they massage it, verify it, and by December 15th, that's the freeze date for equalized pupils. Okay. But, but I just want to note that in my memory, which is long in some respects and short in others, uh, the last few years, they have not come anywhere near those dates. So they're not dates to really depend on. Mm -hmm. Diane, you have a question? So, you know, a couple of things. I absolutely hear what you're saying, Dorothy, about us being very concerned. We know what um, what it looks like out there. I also want to be sure that we understand when we level fund that what that impact is so that we're making uh, as best of an educated uh, decision as we can. That when we, if we have to level fund here or take from there, that we understand what that ripple is and understand where those ripples might continue to go. The, the question I have for you, Lori, is we see the savings from those who are taking early retirement. Have their positions been put back into the other positions and at what rate are we anticipating that? So um, of the positions that um, are retiring nearly, actually almost all, if not all, are at the top of the scale. So when we met with each administrator, we reviewed our, our plan, which was to budget for a middle of the grid, kind of somebody right there in the middle with like eight years experience um, to 10. And then at the uh, health insurance rate, we put in a two person plan for all the replacements expecting that down the road some might take a family plan and some might opt out. So we felt like that was a pretty reasonable expectation. Um, the principal's feedback to me was they thought it was an acceptable value. So on average, so it remains to be seen until you actually do the hiring. Uh, but we did have uh, of the 15 positions, 12.6 would be filled and 2.4 would be unfilled. Just to follow up on that, so the 12 point, whatever it was, um, that is included in that one line that's showing all salaries? 
is what you're that's saying. The, yes, that's the net impact. Not yeah. yeah I didn't split it out, but I yeah, thought it was no, that's fine. Okay. I, and um and then um at some point will we will we hear why it was decided that the others would remain unfilled? At this time it was based on the the census information that we have. So obviously if the census information moves in a different direction, some of those would remain unfilled. Um, and it would hopefully, you know, eliminate the need to reduce staff through a RIF process. But that remains to be seen. We're just still hopeful that we're going to recruit more kids. Jonah? Yeah, Lori, I just want to make sure I understand correctly. You're, you're hearing that the legislature is essentially going to fund education as if schools didn't suffer you know, a, a drop in enrollment. Okay. Yes, we okay. were told that they would use last year's ADM. So where we would see a, a slight decrease would be if last year's ADM was um, less than the year before because it's a two year averaging process. And I'll be happy to go through that at the new board training that we're gonna have on the seventh, uh, on the 18th. Not the new board training, excuse me, the budget training. <laughs> I was planning to bring that information that evening for that training. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions or ways we can move on to, to Brian for the four new initiatives? No, three, I'm just putting the other one. Okay, go ahead, Brian. So uh, th there are three items that were not included in this level service budget. Uh, I'll talk about, uh, th the first one was having a district-wide facility director, which would be a 1.0 FTE. Uh, this person would be able to really help us out with our facilities, develop a capital plan, uh, be able to uh, supervise our and uh, support our uh, custodial staff. Uh, right now, our principals are doing that in the buildings. Uh, the ultimate thing is if we really want our principals to be instructional leaders, uh, we, we really want them to spend more time working with teachers uh, and, and, and anyone who's a custodian, less time with the custodians uh, and facilities. Uh, and so, uh, the uh, and I have I, I have a few I have a number of principals who who spend at least an hour to two, three hours a day on facilities types of things just because uh, we've had a lot of facilities uh, in certain buildings this year so uh, a lot of facilities challenges in certain buildings so I, I think uh, uh, this would be a, an opportunity uh, to also streamline some of the purchasing of materials and items May, I, I'm not going to say that we would get a full return on our investment by hiring a facilities director, but there would, I believe there could be some cost savings there because uh, it is my understanding that uh, di different schools in our district are using different, uh, they're purchasing different materials from different vendors where we may be able to get uh, one vendor to give us a better rate because we're buying more things in bulk. You know, that's just an example, but uh, so that was one thing that uh, I thought was some low hanging fruit where we could really uh, move, get our capital plan going, help, help support the principals, free up some of their time, more time uh, to work on instructional leadership. And, and that was one. Uh, the second thing was that uh, our uh, school district is uh, ne needs some more health instruction in the schools. Uh, right now, there are three schools not offering health instruction. And uh, we just want to make sure we get a, a uh, we get those three schools the opportunity to offer health instruction to our students. And that is a, that would be a 0.6, I believe estimated around a 0.6. I, I hope I'm not off, but that's where we're, I think it's falling. Um, and, the, and that would help out with our three schools, uh, Berlin, Rumney and Doty um, are the three schools that don't have that. So that if we have that, we can say all of our elementary schools, we have equity of, uh, of access for all three schools. And then the uh, last, but certainly not least, and this is uh, one of the, uh, you know, the big questions, it, you know, any, any time uh, you, you have a new superintendent, you're trying to do some, uh, you know, trying to build upon what's already there, but also trying to do some things differently and, and new, uh, the curriculum management review, um, if the board uh, moves forward, if we find someone who's, who can do it and meets our, our specs and can do it and uh, we approve it, prove it in the December meeting, the curriculum uh, management review, we believe would have some recommendations for our schools and districts, district, and that would uh, come out later on this school year. 
And then the piece, the piece that comes out is, you know, if they give us a list of things that we could focus on and do, what do we want to do? And so uh, I don't want to be presumptuous and say, you know, let's, let's have this, this amount of money put aside so we can be proactive in moving our district forward. Uh, I don't, it's just kind of like, uh, we don't know the official amount, what it would be, but, you know, we may want some money on the side or, you know, in, a, in an account so we can start funding some of our newer initiatives that would be coming out of this curriculum management review. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this, Lori, yeah, yeah, I'm not, this is a, a question. Is this where we could possibly use some fund balance? I, I'm just putting it out there and then. Talk about um, having a fund balance recommendation for the next budget draft so that we didn't ask for money that's one time uh, for things that we try to reserve fund balances. Um, and I know, well, you're gonna have a special finance committee meeting, I guess, Laura could speak to that. Okay. So if Brian, and, and I think I kind of confused you. So you skipped okay. one, you moved the, the fourth one to the top, which I'm excited because <laughs> it was the facility director, but it, we left out the strategic planning. So oh, you yeah, had I'm so three, yeah. sorry. I'm yeah, so you had, yeah, yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, I but I'll let you talk about it. We we talked about it. Yeah, I uh, moved it. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's a, it's okay. I, I I fully support. I'm glad that you moved the facility director to number one. But it's, so you had curriculum management, strategic planning, and the health instruction. Yes. So do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the strategic planning as a future? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the uh, idea is if uh, we we get this uh, curriculum management review document uh, completed. Uh, we're then going to have to engage in a strategic planning process where we develop a plan. Uh, and so, you know, so the, the vision here is, you know, imagine having a, you know, a district-wide facility director who's going to be around to help us become more uh, effective and efficient with our facilities operations, developing a capital plan that is going to help prepare our district to plan for future projects up between a five and 10 year process, right? on facilities end, we also are kind of doing something similar with the curriculum management review, the entry plan, uh, going and meeting with our leadership team or uh, engaging teachers, engaging our families and students, and uh, and of course our, our board uh, to engage in a strategic planning process where we can plan a, uh, create a, a strategic plan three, five years, so we can then now have these planning documents out in front of us. So everyone kind of knows here's where we're in, in, in future budget years when we do the budget process you know we have an idea of where we're what we're funding what we're asking people to fund it's very transparent we're asking we would be our communities would be involved they would give input uh, and everyone would kind of know what we're trying to do each year uh, that would that's the plan so I think the you know, the idea was you know, linking that curriculum management review to a strategic planning process in addition to the entry plan and uh, and engaging engaging our communities with some community engagement piece. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Thank you. So 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 now uh, I don't know if our members have questions. Otherwise, we can move into the the timeline the timeline and really talking about uh, uh, doing a community forum too. So and. And more specifics on when the finance committee is going to meet next, but I want to give you the opportunity to give some feedback about the initiatives that we talked at the end in the next budget. Is that okay, Scott? You okay? Any questions, uh, Lindy? Oh, on mute. Um, so the strategic plan what kind of dollars, you know, it's a plan or it's a planning or what does this mean in dollars? I, I don't think we, we know. I, I don't think we know yet, unless Brian, you, you have an, an idea. It, it was just right now, it's just putting four things uh, for the future, for a future budget. Not, uh, we don't have an idea of cost, right, Brian, until we go out. No, no, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know how much, uh, well, I mean, I, I look at it in two parts, uh, uh, Lindy. The uh, the piece of like actually a strategic planning. Do you have a strategic planning consultant that comes in and works with families and works with the board about developing a process? And that costs some money. I don't think that's going to be uh, too. I don't think that's going to be a, a, a lot. A lot of. I mean, a, a, too much money. Uh, but I think where uh, where th things start start uh, costing you know costing money and is when you get a dot when you go through 
after you've done this whole strategic planning process, you get all these ideas, and then you start saying, well, what are we going to try to do in year one, year two, year three, and how, how are we going to fund it? And what, what this piece do we want to put in year three versus year two? Or, and and, and it, that's how uh, – so it's kind of hard to um, identify exactly a specific cost because we have to determine what we actually want to be able to get done and do. Okay, because one of my concerns, and I agree with Dorothy, about um, people feeling their pocketbooks. We're a, we're basically a very small district as far as numbers of students, and keeping that in mind, and our price per student is pretty high, and it has been. So um, I was a little um, concerned with the way dollars are directly attached to outcomes and that our outcomes can't get better without more dollars. Uh, that kind of concerns me a bit to say that. So um, that's why when I see plans and consultants and reviews, I am more concerned about those um, people who are in the buildings doing the teaching and what supports they need versus here comes another initiative, here comes another paper I have to fill out or um, so that's why I'm questioning it and just saying what I'm saying. Thank you, Dorothy. We, we did spend quite a bit of time uh, pushing a little bit uh, with Brian, just saying, you know what, uh, these are all things for the future that we're hoping that we would, would be able to implement and have maybe so many earmark uh, within uh, our fund balance for some specific student uh, outcomes. But we did talk, uh, we, we do hope that they come back to us with some specifics of what we're going to do now. You know, kids do not have a year to waste. So, what initiatives that we're doing right now, whether it's interventions, teacher coaching, uh, that we know this future, uh, this budget draft number two is going to be more specific of how, how we're going to move the needle for those, uh, for those students. Yeah. That in essence will move the needle for everybody else, Brian. Yeah, and I think I think I also heard what Lindy said. You know, concerned that hey, we're a small district. We uh, we uh, want to be able to. I, I definitely agree with you, Flora, that we want to move the needle and 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 definitely uh, you know continue to help our kids and not have a you know a lost year or anything like that uh, with what we could be able to do with what we should do, what we can do, what we can't do. Uh, I think that what's going to happen is at some point. Uh, at the end of this planning process, we're going to have a long list of items to consider, right? I mean, they, they might say, you know, "I'm just," you know, they may say, "You need to really work on math, or you need to work on literacy, or you need to work on every single content area, and you should do this immediately." You know, obviously, that would cost, you know, probably like, you know, uh, money that we don't have. So I think, so I think coming up with, you know, what looking at the recommendations, looking at what the community wants, talking to the leadership team, involving teachers in the process of giving their input and getting their input. I, I think, um, I think you know, there's a way of doing it, which it, I think the communities would be proud that we're not just uh, throwing money around and wasting money. That's, I, I don't think that's, I think there would be a real incentive, I think a real intentional uh, look at what we can do, what we can't do, what we can do later in the future, and push things out. It, it doesn't have to be like everything has to happen tomorrow, uh, but getting an idea of how do we plan for, if we have seven things that we want to do, we can't do all seven in one year because we don't have the money or we don't have the capacity or we don't have the, uh, the, the people to do it. So, but maybe we can do seven things in five years. And how do we fund those seven things over a five-year period, which doesn't uh, uh, hurt our taxpayers or hurt our tax base or overwhelm the system. So I think it's really trying to be strategic about what we want to be able to do and what we can do in a physically respective and responsive way. And the, and the last thing that I would say is that we, at least from my point of view, I'm, I'm hoping that this strict financial times will help transform us instead of decimate us as a district. So transform us to better use the resources that we have to get to where we want to where we want to be. Scott, do you have a question? And, and I think we can move into the timeline. Um, thank you, Flora. I actually don't have any questions, but. Um... Jonas. 
Uh, just before we move into the timeline, I'm looking at last year's budget. I think this is the final draft. Um, uh, the you know total net impact on taxes last year was 3.09 percent, but that was after um, some significantly more revenue uh, than we're getting this year. Um, Lori, you may have mentioned this and explained this, and I was just too dense to catch it. But looking in last year's budget, there was about three hundred twelve thousand dollars of special ed reimbursement compared to one hundred and two this year. Um, what's what, what's that drop in revenue? Related to the state place students, and as well right. as um, yeah. the shifting population, some students are ninety five percent reimbursable, and others are uh, fifty six percent. So, it depends on the cost of the program. Um, I am planning to put together some more special ed charts and stuff for the next budget cycle with Kelly um, and Brian. So you'll see a lot more detail about that, so you'll better understand it in the next draft. Great. Thanks for explaining that twice. Any other questions before we move into the timeline? So we are, if you have your timeline in front of you, we, we are today, November 4th, looking at the first draft. Our hope is to have the board budget training on the 18th and the finance committee is gonna meet on the 17th in, in the morning to look at, uh, to come back to you with a possible proposal of what our community budget forum uh, could look like in, I actually would like to spend more, a little, a teeny bit of time talking about that, if that's okay with the, with everybody. And then the, you know, the timeline is pretty self-explanatory as you see it there on the draft. But it, we had a brief conversation about being able to give a, a chance to community members to give us meaningful input, and what does that look like? So if you guys wanted to email any of the finance committee people or email myself to put together something for. For the next meeting or if you have some specific ideas right now and i'm specifically looking at the finance committee members to see if i'm missing something or there's any input regardless that uh, that very important part <laughs> reaching out to our communities otherwise i send it back to you scott i don't see any uh dorothy um i i'm yes. sorry but i guess i'm showing my age yeah. To have a board budget training and a board meeting on the same night, it's going to be too much for me, and I don't know if it's for other people too. Our, our board meetings are long, and I'm not complaining about that, but to add a, a budget training on top of it, I, I think is asking a lot for our heads. Um, so I, I, don't, I can't give you a suggestion of, of when to put it. Uh, maybe some other people feel the same way or they don't, but I would go along with the crowd. So Dorothy, we talked about it as a finance committee and trying to you know, not burden administrators too with more, more time. We felt like we originally were thinking of doing a community budget forum on the 18th, but we felt that we wouldn't be ready for, for that yet. And it was important for us as, it's an optional training. So if you don't, you know, but, uh, it would be great to have the entire board there. Right now, we, a lot of our committees are meeting right before the meeting with the quality committee just met before. So I, I would love to accommodate <laughs> as many people as possible, but at the same time, the urgency of being able to be prepared for the December 2nd meeting really doesn't give us a lot of options. And I hate to put more nights out for people it, you know, Jonas is already meeting twice a week, I think, for negotiations with some others and the administrators. So it's really hard to get all those schedules. So I'm not trying to say it is not important what you just said. I completely respect that. And I find myself not knowing if I'll be able to stay up tonight, for example. <laughs> it's just been too many meetings this week, but it's just the reality of budgeting season. So if there's somebody else that can't do it, yes, Carrie. And Jonas, sorry, I, I think Jonas was first and then you, Kari, whoever. I just didn't, yep, I didn't. Fine. Okay, Kari. Well, if it's okay to, to change topics a little bit, I wanted to say another thing that the committee talked about um, is that one of the ways that this budgeting process can work well is when the board doesn't micromanage the line items of the budget, but establishes what our expectations are early in the process and provides guidance 
um, to the superintendent and the team to go out and develop that. And so the committee talked about um, using time on the 18th for the board to set those parameters, if you will, so whether they're expectations or or um, priorities or, or however we want to frame them. And so the request is if people could be thinking about what those might be if you have ideas about them and bring them on the 18th or share them with the committee because the committee is going to talk about maybe making a recommendation on some parameters uh, when we meet next. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That was very important. Anything else on finance, Brian or uh, Laurie? No, uh, just, yeah, I think you covered it. I mean, and, and I think the you know, we community forums, uh, this tentative dates that we have were uh, December 2nd, January 13th, and February 17th. And then you guys will have more information before that meeting on the 18th. So with the specific questions, just to remind you about what's going on on that board training. Are you okay with that, Dorothy? Yeah, I said I'd go along with whatever. I just okay. wrote So plan on an EC 17th, so you're ready for the 18th. Okay, Scott, back to you. Thank you very much, Flora. Thanks, everybody. Um, it occurs to me that some of you have been at it for three hours already. So um, how about if we take five and uh, just refresh however you choose? And um, I, I think we can probably get back and, and go through the rest of the agenda without too much ado. Five minutes, so 8.02, see you back here. Oh, Brian? Yeah, I just want to say that the... Uh principals who are here, you know, they, they, they can, if they wish to stay, they can, but I know they have a long day tomorrow. So I'm going to, they can go home if they, they can go on, turn off their Zoom if they would like. You know, that's all. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Terrific. Thanks very much. Thank See you. you all in five minutes. My computer clock shows 8.03. Um, if, uh, if there's anybody there, we can get restarted. Wonderful, great floor. Okay, um, as I mentioned before, Chris McVeigh is unfortunately tied up with a client this evening, unfortunately for, for us. Um, so will, uh, uh, if anyone from the policy committee would like to manage this part of the meeting, you're welcome to, otherwise I'll, you know, blunder my way through it as usual. Um, anybody want to take it on? If not, um, we have 3.4.1, first reading of policy C12, prevention of sexual assessment as prohibited by Title IX on page 27. Are there any, um, are there any Amendments uh, or corrections, changes, questions on C12? Diane, and then Brian. So I, I believe this, I mean, I, I'm wondering how much of this is boilerplate that's being required and just wanting to make sure that we understand that um, in terms of our responsibility as well. Oh. So, a policy committee person, uh, Brian, please. Yeah, uh, and I don't, I don't know if Kelly's Kelly. I don't see is Kelly here. I know Kelly's been a big part of. Uh, there she is. I'm gonna let Kelly. Uh, Kelly's been a, a, a taking a lead on this uh, policy, uh, and has been uh, extremely helpful in this whole process. I'll let Kelly talk. So yes, you know Diane, you hit it on the head, right? This policy has been developed for Visbit and the SBA. It is a required policy that actually went. Uh, Title IX is a new law that went into effect in mid-August, um, and this is just a template that we received that was developed by Heather Lynn um, that, you know, we're asking you to do a first read tonight, then the policy committee will revisit it for a second reading and hopefully an adoption next time.
Thanks, Kelly. Um, you're good with that, Diane? And Brian. Yeah, and uh, I also just want to, and it's too bad Chris is not here tonight because uh, we had a, a discussion, uh, and I'll, you know, full disclosure, Chris and I had a back and forth in uh, policy, having a very civil discussion about uh, Title IX and uh, the there was a part of that, a, pa a part about it in, in it where there was a, a disagreement about whether or not we need to keep the procedures uh, in the title, in the policy. And so he, he believed that the procedures for conducting a Title IX sexual harassment investigation needed to be in it. And, uh, you know, and he's not here tonight. So I was wanted to tell him, he, tell him this, but uh, and we had, uh, had, had a good conversation about it because uh, uh, I was operating under the uh, belief that you don't put the procedures into the policy uh, for many different reasons. Uh, well, uh, I, we asked Kelly to go back to uh, legal counsel after our conversation and after we had sent this out uh, already in the board packet, and it turns out that Chris was correct uh, on this policy in particular, that we want to put the procedures for Title IX investigation, but because we didn't have it out already in the, um, uh, we didn't have it out already in the, uh, in the packet, uh, we did call, I called Chris, and Chris had said it was okay, and that he would speak on it, on it tonight, but he's not here tonight, but I wanted him to tell, tell you know, it's a, it's uh, too bad because uh, you know, we were told to keep it in the packet, and and so it'll be in the next the next iteration. You know, obviously we'll go back to policy, but the procedures will also be in the packet for this policy. Uh, it's very generous of you, and even though Chris is not here today, having been right, uh, it, it's uh, it's great that at least all the rest of us know. <laughs> so thanks. Um, are there any other uh, any other is there any other work to be done with um, with this C12 policy or shall we just um, consider it first reading back to the policy committee for preparation for the second reading and passage? Sounds good. All right, great. So um, we can move on then to 3.4.2, second reading and adoption. Um, I would propose uh, that one of you who would like to do this, um, <clears throat> move the policies as a slate, and then we can treat them as a slate. I can uh, do that, Scott. Oh. Go ahead, Jail. Thank you. Um, let me just So Jail moves, is there a second? I will second. Thank you, Jonas. Okay. So, um, discretion. You remember them from two weeks ago, I think. Um, I don't recall that there, uh, Lindy, yes, please. I think you were just going to say what I was going to ask. Generally, there's red lines if there were any um, changes suggested, and I don't see any. So my understanding is there weren't changes since the first reading, but that's what I wanted clarified. Yeah, um, that's my recollection. Um, <clears throat> Jonas is usually very good at remembering such things. If um, in no, the absence all, of all I'm doing is looking in last <laughs> in the last minutes. I I, I remember <clears throat> that we. <clears throat> I yeah. remember we didn't make any changes. Good. Okay. So if you'd like to move to a vote then. Oh, uh, wait, there, 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 there was one on, but is it in, sorry. Um, yeah, F1, right. We wanted to look at whether we needed to include a clause about, um, making sure that commuting, right, regular commuting is not reimbursed uh, in travel policy, and it is in there. Uh, so that change was made from the first reading to the second reading. Uh, we're not getting a red line copy, um, but from what I'm looking at in the minutes from the last meeting, that was the only thing that we really asked the policy committee to look at. Thank you, Jess. Great. Um, any further concerns or uh We can go to the vote. All in favor of that slate of policies as moved by Jael and 
seconded by Jonas. Please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. I'm seeing all yeses. So the motion passes. The policies are passed on second reading. Um, so uh, that brings us to 0.5, negotiations committee update um, without following the uh, IB um, Jonas. Uh, so we were going to have a, uh, a group IBD training session uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, on Monday evening uh, with both the teachers and the ESP facilitated by uh, a, a, a woman who's, whose name I forget. Unfortunately, she had to cancel. Um, that There's a silver lining for me because I couldn't attend on Monday. Um, we're trying to reschedule for next Tuesday, um, which would work for me, Diane. Um, you indicated it wouldn't work for you, but you know, I, I I wouldn't worry so much about that. We'll we'll catch you up. I'm sure you know the you know the the bones of it at this point, and you know whatever materials we've got, we'll we'll make sure you've got. Um, so hopefully that goes off on Tuesday, uh, and it'll give us a chance to talk about scheduling the negotiation sessions, who goes first, um, and uh, you know the logistics of getting this rolling. That's all I got. Unless Brian, there was something you wanted to. Okay. Thanks. Um, any board member questions for Jonas? All good. Thanks very much, Jonas. Um, okay, Central Vermont Career Center update. Is that you, Fleur? Or sure. And I, Brian is here too, and I, I think Stephen probably. I don't know if Stephen left. Oh, there he is. So Stephen and and Brian and myself are are the little mighty team for the Career Center. If, so what we wanted to share tonight, especially, is that the BUUSD, that means the Berry School Board, now merged, uh, voted unanimously in October 22nd to uh, start a process to get bids to, uh, to, for a site selection for the Career Center. So basically what is, uh, what is happening right now, because we are not a... Um, we, we, we sit on this board, but we don't, we don't really govern the career center, just the way that this has been set up for, for the state. So the ultimate decision to make that decision is on the Barry school board, not in all the sending districts. And Brian and, and um, Stephen can correct me if I'm <laughs> mistaken in any of those. So it, to me, it's exciting. I, I think at least our team is excited. So what we mean is that uh, starting they're putting proposals out for year 22 uh, to try to find, uh, decide if they can make it bigger at, uh, in Barrie, where the career center is to meet the needs and the, and the hopes and dreams for this new career center, or if there's a better site within uh, the sending districts. And I, I will let Steven speak to this because he's been also in this in this meetings for the same longer than me and and Brian. If I'm missing something, Stephen, or I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, the the uh, career center has been looking at uh, at expanding their space so that their offerings can uh, so they can improve some of their offerings and uh, provide some additional ones. This conversation has been going on for at least three or four, or four years now. Um, and so now they're at a phase where they want to at least go see us if there are available sites um, uh, for them or if they can expand where they're at. And so it's really just a study. It's not uh, it's not a commitment uh, because the biggest hurdle and, of course, all of this is funding for building a new facility. New facility. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's the update. Brian, any anything else? Uh, you know, it's just. Yeah, we, we felt at least we felt like it's really exciting, right? Especially coming from COVID, uh, you know, putting resources into technical center and seeing a better way to integrate it. Uh, of course, we don't really have governance <laughs> over it, so we're just ascending district. Uh, we are advisory. So, um, and I and I know the Barry uh, School Board would like to share that governance part, <laughs> just mm. for the record. Uh, that's it, Scott. Thank you, Fleur. Are there any board member questions on Career Center? No. Not? 
<laughs> oh, Dorothy. Right. Yes. Sorry. Um, I, I'm I'm wondering if we get to be part of the governance, are we then going to be raising the money to put up the new building, or are we are really going to be part of that? It, it's too early to tell uh, to tell Dorothy, but I I. I think it's a longer conversation. I don't want to speculate in, in 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 anything, but it would be within yeah, it would be within that community. Uh, right now, um, most sending districts lack that direct control and governance over uh, how to influence direction, and you know, not just in building but in programming, uh, which is which is really huge. And and in Vermont, we still have uh, we don't. The way that we're funding uh, tech education, we're not able to expose kids in middle school enough. We're not, you know, I, this conversation can be really, really long. And we don't, we compete for funding. So there's a lot of things that are not qu quite right in the way. And more kids should be exposed to technical education. And there should be more of a cross between some of our, for example, robotics should be part of the thing. You know, like there's there's a lot of potential. So I don't want to make it sound like it's just the spending money uh, would be spending money. I'm not suggesting that that you know that we know where that center is going to go. It's it's good. It's a study. So it's just getting uh, ideas for 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 the growth of something that we know is really important for sustaining Vermont as a as for for the future I, I i i totally agree with all of that i i just i i guess it is going to be a long-term thing but we really need to do do more uh, for more of, of our students in that regard and, and yeah. it, even if we're, if we're going to have to dig into our pockets as long as it's more or less even with all the other pockets that are part of that center yeah thank you great thanks very much um anything else on your career center if not we can move on to 3.7 vsba update sounds like you again Flo. okay <laughs> it's a busy night so we uh, we had the resolutions uh, meeting and uh, the regional meeting and all of the resolutions, uh, the nine resolutions that you guys had. I got input from most of you. I missed three of you, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I, I did try to reach all of you. Uh, and uh, we pretty much voted. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go resolution by resolution or just one. I, I was just going to update you. We voted exactly uh, like... Uh, the recommendation had been the only change uh, was in the resolution fourth, which is the career center. Uh, they submitted uh, an amendment that was not part of the package. So at the last minute, at the last minute. So so the uh, each representative for each district uh, had to you know uh, take a vote without have being able to go back. But that's part of uh, representing. And pretty much what they did is they striked out is curious enough is the same thing that we were just talking about. So it it striked out the the part that was trying to uh, control the answer of the of the question whether we should have governors or not uh, and more influence in the career center. That was the resolution number four. And then instead of it was recommended to not pass, it did pass because they take took out that language. It's more of a is now more about exploring a better funding and um, and the governance issue for for the sending schools to adequate influence that direction without the trying to control because we don't want to be involved in telling the legislation try to tell them how to do the outcome right so so they did change that language that's all I have to to share everything else it, it was it was it was the same and especially the one about holding us harmless for the students is gonna be really important for us uh, this year. So that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions for Fleur on the VSBA update? And Fleur, um, what's the next step on these resolutions? So the resolutions are basically guidance for the executive director to, they're not resolutions that pass on the state house, it's guidelines that gives direction 
for for the board about what are the important issues for the membership during uh, during the year. So as soon as the um, the session opens uh, next year, it will serve as guidance for for Sue Zagoski and her team to to help move uh, uh, policy in a direction that helps uh, with those recommendations, along with the other recommendations that are already part of the of the BSBA. It just adds to our guidance uh, to them. Okay. Great, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, if there's nothing else, we can move on to item four, board operations, board norms, which begin on page 49. And um, I must confess, I, I wasn't able to attend the agenda setting meeting at which this was put on, so I, I I don't know exactly, I see discretion action. Are we adopting, may I ask my esteemed colleagues, um, the proposal is that we um, move to adopt the, the items that are there? The proposal is to have a discussion uh, about the norms. So we have three, uh, you know, we have the norms that we had before when we were all, uh, when for the full, what we call the full board of U32. And then we have the norms, uh, two other examples of norms, ones that you send, ones that are used at U32 right now. So the idea is to spend some time we have, you know, a, you know it's been a long day. So however much time uh, people feel that they have right now to, to be able to not do this by a small committee, but everybody agree on, 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 on what is important. And we narrow it down to these three examples. So if you guys had a chance to read them, uh, Jill or anybody else that we want to share from the planning, please do. It, it's all, you know, we keep pushing this down the road. And so it's pretty critical that we get to um, deciding what these are so that we better understand how to frame our work and how we should be responding. So um, we're always, you know, I get it that we're especially tired today, but it, that's why we've put it on there um, is so that we can actually hopefully get it done. Yeah. I mean, my, my feeling as I look at these three is that I actually think the first one is the closest to where I was hoping we would end up because it's the most sort of like, what do we do when something happens, which is what I was looking for in board norms. Um, the third one I feel like is a little bit more um in more like how does the individual operate within a within a meeting which it has value but i didn't think it was the same thing as what i was hoping for in the board norms and then i think i thought the middle one uh had a lot of overlap actually with both of the other two and could probably be partially incorporated into a new draft maybe of the first one and then there's some things that are really our legal obligations that i actually didn't think needed to be in the norms that was my that was my thinking. I mean, I feel like I could take the the first two and probably a little bit of three and make them into one document. Um, but it would look the most like the first one with some changes as I reflected on it and looked at it again. I, and I'm also I would volunteer to take a crack at it. Let me just say that. You would volunteer. Did I hear that correctly? I have some background yes. noise. Yes, I would volunteer, but that would be the direction I would be going in. So I'd want to get a sense for if that sounded like the right direction. Um, great. Uh, Lindy and then Dorothy. And then Jonas. Um, I immediately was pulled to the first one because it looks like norms to me. And it, when I first mm -hmm. looked, I thought that was our norms document. And the only one I had concern with was the um, role at the end of the each board meeting reflect on we don't ever have time to do that and it's too late to even do pluses yeah. and deltas like I'm used to in meetings um, but I think the first one I could adopt without any problem at all um, and I agree with Jill about the third one and the second one just seemed like such a list of more or less my duties as a board, not as norms. So I would go with the first one fine. Yeah, I, Scott, if I can just comment, there were there was one, I'm trying, I gotta look at it. 
There's one thing in the first one. Oh, I think the public comment was actually not our, pra our current practice. So I would want to adjust that. Um, and then it also doesn't get at the, what do we do if a new topic comes up, which I really care about a lot. And so I would want to add one on that. Okay. Go for it, Joe. You have the power of the drafter. Dorothy and then Jonas. I, I see Dorothy. <laughs> I'm good with that, Jill. Uh, just keep it as okay. nice and short and brief as the first one, if possible. Yeah, that was my intent. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jonas? Uh, I think that page two is a really nice summation of, um, um, you know, the initial new board training that I got from VSBA a couple of years ago. But Jill, I'm aligned with you on, on everything you said. I think there's a bunch of stuff in that second page that can be incorporated, but I think you're spot on. Okay. Okay, great. I'll work on a draft then, unless anybody wants a different direction. Oh, Caroline's got her hand up. Caroline, please. Um, I just would want a little more definition on the first one, communicate to the public about public comments. So not only do we not do that, but what does that mean? We respond to them about their comments. Um, I think I think it means let them know there is such a thing. That's how I read it, but I agree it's a little unclear. So like invite them to come and speak, maybe. Um, and then I the only I other think one. The, yeah, go ahead. I, I was making that up. That's just how I was interpreting it. I don't know what it meant. Yeah, I I felt like it was a little unclear. The only other thing is the role of the board and not spending time in the weeds. I would actually define a little bit of because what's the weeds for one person might not be to somebody else. And I I really like this document, um, but I think that's an area that the more precise we can get, the better we'll run and the more comfortable the administration can be. So that's my mm -hmm. comment. Yep. Okay, that one, yeah, that may be the most challenging, but I, I also agree with you. It needs, yeah, it needs some work. Mm. All right. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to speak to a couple concepts that um, in support of in when you're working on this, Jill. One is, um, in my opinion, the the point about reflecting at the end of the meeting is actually important, and I think it's something that we should um, try to do as a discipline. And it's really about um, reflecting on meeting effectiveness and our overall performance so that we can support our ongoing improvement. Um, and I think I know it's an investment of time and it's painful at the end, um, but but I think it's important. And the other one I would say is communicating out um, the, the top level takeaways um, from the meeting to to our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That's another practice that we could um, take on that would be um, meaningful. Thanks. Okay, that's helpful. Hello. I, I, I agree with everything that has been said. I, I do think that the community involvement, we should have a little discussion about that because we've been talking as a steering committee about moving a, a community input into a public comments also. So we should have that conversation as we move. It would be part of the agenda, but make sure because that's not our practice like we were saying, right? We each community, that was sort of a previous practice. We It's the meeting of the of the board and we care very much about the, the public, but we have so much to get done. So we've been talking about putting public comments as a steering committee at the end, eh, not at the beginning of the meeting. That's one thing. And then in, in, in respect each other, I think there's a couple of things that we could incorporate from, from, the, from the third page without, eh, and you can you know look into it, Jill, but there's a couple of things within mm -hmm. that line that we should be able to uh, uh, to incorporate, you know, for example, between in intent and impact, or even just the mindful listening, which we practice at our yeah. our retreat, uh, are just important yeah. reminders. And th that's it. That's perfect. Okay. I think it's doable. That um, I I'm tremendously grateful. I think we all are. That um, what I should ask is, does anyone have an objection to Jill um, drafting up a norms document for us to um, to approve, possibly even at our next meeting? 
I don't see any expressions of discontent. So, um, by consensus, okay. you're the one, Joe. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Yep. Many, many thanks. Happy to. Okay. Sure thing. So, um, should we move on then to the consent agenda, um, approving the minutes of October 21st, starting on page 52? Um, would anybody like to move to approve the minutes of October 21st? I will move to approve the minutes of October 21st. Thank you, Jonas. Second? Uh, I will second since I'm not on mute. <laughs> Taking advantage. Wonderful. So Jonas moves, Jill seconds. Are there any changes to the minutes of October 21st? Oh, Caroline, yes, please. It has my name down as attending by teleconference and I actually missed that meeting. Thank you, uh, I think that also realized I misspelled Jill's name in that document a couple times, so I'll change that too. Oh, I didn't even look closely enough. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it happens a lot. I mean, not just with you, all over the place. <laughs> so sometimes I notice, sometimes I don't. Thank you. Sorry. Great. Um, and that goes for you too, David Delacour. You did it too in the newspaper. <laughs> Lisa, I also wasn't at that meeting. Okay. You were not at that meeting, Jael. That was your mm -hmm. daughter's birthday. Yes. yes. Okay, I'll change that. Sorry. Um, anything else? Otherwise, it looks good to me. All right. In that case, all in favor, please, of approving the minutes as, um, as moved and seconded, please click yes. If you're opposed, please click no. And it looks like all the yeses. So the minutes are approved. Um, now for the board orders, um, uh, Lindy, I have come uh, to rely on you, but um, I, I shouldn't impose oh, I've that. I've got them open. Wonderful. Would you mind then, please? Keeps me on my toes. Um, I make a motion to approve board orders in the amount of $389,334.67. And the other one is thirty thousand nine hundred sixty four dollars twenty cents thank you lindy lisa did you get that okay yes thanks great thank you uh do we have a second we are seconds thank you um with some backup uh so uh, are there any questions any um any concerns they look good to all of you. All right, in that case, if you approve the board orders as moved by Lindy and seconded by Floor, please click yes. Um, opposed, click no. And all yeses, thank you very much. And um, I won't shirk my responsibility this time to remind you to kindly send in an email with your, with your signature, electronic signature in lieu of. Um, thank you very much. So moving on to six, 6.1, approving new teachers um, or new employees. Um, would anybody like to move that, please? I have it open if you want me to. That would be great, Lindy. Thank you. Okay. I move. Uh approving the nomination of Casey LeClerc as school nurse at U32 as detailed on the nomination form. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Diane seconds and Caroline there too. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, are there any questions? Uh, I noticed that um, provisional license Good. Um, so, uh, Floyd, did you have a question? Sorry, I was signaling to some. Not it was not. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, great. So, um, if 
there are no questions, um, all in favor of the motion as uh, moved by Lindy and um, seconded by Diane, please click yes and opposed, click no. And once again, I see all yeses. Many thanks, everyone. So we now, um, un unless, uh, unless there's something else that I'm missing, we can move on to public comments, round two. Um, if any member of the public wishes to make a comment, um, it would be great if you could click raise hand or star six if you're on the phone. Um, Otherwise, if I don't hear from anyone, we can move to future agenda items, um, which are listed here. Energy Project Consultants, Articles of Agreement, which um, I believe refers back to Kari's and, and Jill's. Oh, oh, Jael, sorry, did I miss something? Please. Well I just have a question. I know we had on the agenda for a while the name change of the district, and then I thought we changed it, but I keep seeing, I thought we took out the unified or the union or something, but it's still on like all the documents. So I don't know. My memory is not um, serving me well. Uh, uh, do we change neither. the name or do we still need to have that discussion? Well, it, we haven't actually formally changed the name. Um, I think it's a discussion worth having. Um, we kind of put it on um, on the back burner, I think, because of everything else that has taken precedence. But um, it's something, uh, I, would you like to have it included on the future? It doesn't have to be. I just, I just for some reason, was thinking that we had um, had the discussion, but... Um, <laughs> I think it's something we should bring up when we have some space in the agenda. Yeah, that would be a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott, can I just ask a question about the board orders uh, yes. email? Yes. I, board, I think just got one going that I saw, but does it need to go? I think it only it's only going to the board as you sent it. Does it need to go or does that go to the administrators too? I couldn't tell. I was trying to not CC all of you. I just I just resent it. I usually send it. To oh, you did. Okay. And this, uh, sorry, I just okay. by, just as a note to you guys, but the amounts are accurate. I just forgot to CC the administrators, so I just oh, okay, great. Yeah, because I usually just try to send it to them instead of all of you, because you don't need to see it. Just they do. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great. So, um, on the energy project consultant, my understanding is that the finance committee has first crack. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. On articles of agreement, the issue is maybe um, reducing the size of the board back to 10 or 11 from um, 15. And there is a, uh, is that in the policy committee or um, that has been discussed by somebody? Is no, we, we had informal conversations as a, as a, as a whole board. And, but I, I think that should be something discussed by the, by the entire board, just like, we have thrown a lot of ideas out, but when you know when we have the the the, the time and right. because we need to bring it to vote, it has to go to the voters in order to make the change. But realistically, right. we're always about thirteen, so ideally, we could go back to ten and have three uh, at large members. Is one idea right. to but right? That sounds great. Okay. So, um, but it should so be a huge it, board decision. We'll bring I think. it to the board. Yeah. Great. And superintendent job description and evaluation. Um, Caroline, Chris, and I with Brian are working on this. I, I got off to a very late start, but we've been sort of batting things back and forth and we'll, um, we'll get that together um, and, um, and advance on that and have something for the board as soon as um, as soon as we can, um, Lindy. I I just got Floor's email and don't want to announce it to everybody, but the numbers are wrong. Floor, 
So don't cut and paste her um, numbers. I'm looking at the board order and it's three eight nine three three four six seven and thirty thousand nine sixty four twenty. Okay, thank you very much. Some of you are frozen to me now, but maybe my internet will get better. Uh, um, many thanks. And I think um, if this, this is a very good practice to just help each other out um, and correct each other. Um, Lord knows I absolutely rely on it from you, all of you. So, and, and I'm grateful for it. Um, so there's nothing more left on the agenda before adjourning, but um, I don't want to just uh, peremptorily close out before you have a chance to say anything that might be on your minds. Kari, uh, and then Brian. Could I, just, could I just suggest real quickly on that um, board size topic, a way we might approach it? Um, and um, with efficiency in mind that uh, we just put a, a short agenda item on to, to just kind of go through as a group what we think the pros and cons are and then take a straw poll and see if this is something that we want to spend any time and effort on this year. And if, if we do, then we can quickly assign a small group or, or maybe it's an existing committee to develop how the language and how it would actually work. Wonderful. So... Um, pros and cons, round the table, straw poll, and then small group. Um, how does that sound, everybody? Um, great. Okay. Thank you very much, Kai. I think that's a that's a terrific idea. Um, very good. A anything else before we um, before we go? I but just... I'm noticing there is. Oh, a Brian, sorry. Well, I was just noticing there's a hand raised in the participants and I'm, oh, so I'm not sure. Oh my gosh. Um, right. That's, is that David? Yes, it is. And I just wanted to say real quickly, uh, David Lawrence from Middlesex, that um, about five minutes ago, a comment was made to the effect of, um, are we considering the name change at all? As someone who's never liked the an acronym that has both a literal W and a W in it. <laughs> I would like to also highly support that this be something that's discussed. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we had a public comment. Okay, thank you, David. Um, and, and Brian. Um, <clears throat> uh, just wanted to point out, that hopefully I'm not jinxing anything, but uh, it's 8.44 and uh, we're actually gonna about to and the board meeting early tonight. Yeah, so um, just wanted to point that out. Yeah, the board, uh, I thought the board was very effective and efficient. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> <He's not gonna laughs> thanks. We didn't ask you enough questions, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, next time. Uh, I jinxed it. There we yeah. go. <laughs> uh, it's <clears throat> my thanks to all of you. I greatly appreciate it. Um, so if there's no objection, we can adjourn by consensus at 844. Yeah. Take good care, yep. everyone. Sleep Bye, well. Everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night.